Good morning. I'm Nigel Leatherby, training manager with Paratech. You here to introduce the next in the series of our webinars. The next webinar that's coming up will be heavy rigging and winching. And the presenter on that webinar will be Josh Thompson. I've known Josh for over a decade and he's proficient with uh, lifting, moving, rigging and winching. He's a great guy and he'll be uh, conducting this uh, webinar. Josh is working with the Blue Collar Training Network. So it's a line of webinars that they will be doing. Uh, we'll also be using other people to do other webinars that across the line. Uh, if you take a look at the YouTube section, uh, we got a comment section there. Uh, the first slide that you see is actually a slide that you, you're gonna get on your computer. If you take a look to the right of the virtual workshop, you'll see a, a, a bar there that's for the chat bar. That's where you're going to leave comments and questions and things like that. Uh, we will answer the, the easy questions uh, straight away because we'll have a bunch of RSMs that will be online answering those questions. Some of the difficult ones we'll take, uh, we'll answer after the webinar in a group chat. Uh, that Josh can answer live. So that's what, what's going to happen with that one. Uh, the next page you see is the, the actual bar or the, the chat bar on your computer will be at the bottom. Uh, same thing, doesn't make a difference. You can still go in and, and ask questions and answer, and we'll answer the questions in the chat if we're able to. If not, we can leave them till after the workshop for the group chat. Then the last the last slide you see here is for your smartphone. On the smartphone, it's a little bit different. You could take a look at the, the picture on the left. It's got the, the virtual workshop on top with the actual chat below it. And some some smartphones will actually have uh, the, the, the landscape. If you put your phone on the landscape so it gets you a bigger picture for the virtual workshop, you'll have the chat in the, in the corner just to the, the, the left on the bottom. Uh, if you take a look at the top the top uh, picture, I think that is there just for to give you the full screenshot on your cell phone or your smartphone. Again, I'm Nigel Leatherby. I'm the training manager with Paratech. I hope you enjoy this webinar. I'll put it over to Josh Thompson from Blue Training Network. Thank you. All right. Hello, everybody. My name is uh, Josh Thompson with the Blue Collar Training Network, and I'm going to go over. Uh, uh, we're going to do a lecture today on some heavy rigging and uh, winching stuff. And we're going to big things we want to talk about today. Um, some of the learning objectives. We're going to go into a lot of the uh, the standards that uh, coincide with all of our heavy rigging gear and our overhead lifting stuff. Stuff that's governed. Uh, we're kind of governed by uh, between OSHA and ASME, and we'll get into what those are and who they are. We'll get into a lot of our heavy rigging terminology. Um, like I said, common term terminology is important. So when you're uh, requesting equipment from your guys or looking to purchase things or anything like that, everybody's on the same page of what you're asking for. We're going to go over uh, the inspection criteria and specifications for all our heavy rigging gear. Uh, like I said, anything used for overhead lifting, it needs to be inspected and logged, and we'll get into that later. And when I say all of our heavy rigging gear, the things we're going to be talking about are uh, our overhead lifting slings, our heavy rigging hardware and accessories, our manual lever hoist like uh, chain hoist and come alongs and wire rope pullers and things like that. We'll also get into a lot of our uh, some of our heavy equipment that's designed for more of a toe and tie down uh, application. Um, we're going to talk about a lot of the heavy rigging principles and best practices, some things that are kind of uh, do's and don'ts, a lot of winching techniques and some things you need to consider, like uh, talking about uh, uh, friction coefficients and things that may uh, affect the load and affect your uh, winching operation to make sure that you account for those so the operation goes uh, more smoothly and we don't damage or, or injure anyone. We'll talk about utilizing pulleys with our winching techniques and our manual lever hoist going into like uh, how they work as a change of direction as well as mechanical advantage. And we're also gonna go into some proper rigging and stabilization for your lifting struts. Some things that a lot of people don't realize that we need to uh, consider with those, especially when we start getting into heavy loads and heavy vehicles and things like that. All right. So the first thing we're gonna get into is we need to kind of go over a lot of the things that govern and 
um, why our uh, overhead lifting equipment is designed the way that it's uh, that it's designed. And the big thing with that is going to be um, Occupational Safety and Health Administration, OSHA. Um, here in the U.S., we are, as the fire department, we are uh, governed by OSHA. We do get a little bit of a gray area on an actual rescue because, like I said, a lot of the OSHA standards are more of like a, um, industrial standards or uh, job-specific standards, construction standards, things like that. And they're not designed for rescue, but I could say 98, 99% of the time, what we're, when we're utilizing this quiz equipment, most of the time it's training. So we are going to be uh, governed by those standards. Not all states are OSHA um, states. Some states choose to have their own safety standards, but there is like a, a little, I don't want to say, I guess for lack of a better word, a loophole. And the way that works in the U.S. is not every state is an OSHA state, but if you choose not to, uh, to be an OSHA state, you have to have that state has to have safety parameters in place that meet or exceed the OSHA standards. So in a roundabout way, we kind of have to follow those standards anyways. All right. Um, what the uh, what the the OSHA standard that is going to go in for that governs all of our overhead lifting slings and lifting hardware is going to be 1910184. It's a slings and material handling standard. Basically, what it is, it's a regulation documenting federal mandates for the inspection, testing, and repair of all of your overhead lifting slings. And we'll tell you what doc, uh, will determine whether they need to be re removed from service, all right? And one of the big things that a lot of people don't realize that the OSHA standard uh, uh, mentions and requires is that all overhead rigging and equipment is inspected and logged annually by a designated person. And like I said, I know a lot of fire pipe departments out th throughout the country aren't very good at this. And we're trying to kind of spread that knowledge that needs to be taken care of. So um, it's very similar to your rope standard with NFPA, you know, NFPA mandates that all your life rescue stuff has to be um, inspected after every use and periodically, and it needs to be inspected and logged like quarterly. Same thing going, uh, goes with your overhead lifting slings, especially chain. It needs to be inspected after every use periodically and it should be inspected at least annually, and those records should be logged and maintained for at least one year until the the, uh, the next inspection can replace it, all right? What a designated person is. A designated person per OSHA is a person that is selected or signed by the, uh, the employer or the employer's representative, and that person is trained and qualified to perform specific duties. In this case, they would be trained to properly inspect overhead lifting and heavy rigging gear and accessories. And there are a lot of classes and a lot of uh, uh, rigging companies, crane company manufacturers off a lot of these classes where you can send your individuals to and they can get certified and be taught exactly what they're supposed to be looking for um, and how to properly inspect and log that equipment. All right, we'll, we're gonna hit a lot of those things that you kind of need to be looking for, but this obviously this presentation isn't going to certify you as a as a competent person or a designated person per OSHA. All right. One of the other uh, uh, things we need to understand is ASME. ASME is basically the American Society of Mechanical Engineers. And what that means, what they are is they're a, 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 an American standard organization that promotes science, engineering, research, and like training and safety standards for a lot of different equipment, including a lot of your heavy reading gear. So a lot of those uh, requirements that that gear needs to maintain um, in the United States for whether it be chain or synthetic slings or manual lever hoist or hooks or shackles or any of those equipment, um, ASME is gonna be the ones that kind of determine how that needs to be made, what's mandated, what the tag needs to ha have and all those um, safety requirements that need to be in place uh, in that piece of equipment through the manufacturer, all right? Um, I know everyone, here isn't necessarily from the United States. So I would recommend being um, very familiar with your country's uh, safety standards and how they apply to overhead lifting and whatever equipment you may be carrying. All right, so the big ASME standards that apply to what we're gonna be talking about today are um, the list, listed there on the left, uh, B30, 9, 10, 21, and 26, which is gonna cover your overhead lifting slings, lifting hooks, your manual lever hoist, and then all your rigging hardware. All right, so ASME, the way this works is OSHA doesn't really want to reinvent the wheel. It's a pretty gener generic standard. It covers a lot of things, but uh, ASME has a much more stringent and fine-tuned standard on a lot of these things, so they're just going to reference that standard and say follow that 
So anytime, so remember a standard is something like NFPA where we choose as a department to follow that, where the OSHA um, is a regulation which more holds the power of law. But anytime a standard is mentioned in that regulation, it now holds the power of that regulation. So if there's an ASME standard or an ANSI standard that's mentioned in an OSHA regulation, it now holds the power of that regulation, which means you kind of have to adhere to it. All right. All right. Getting into some of our rigging terminology, some things we need to understand before we move forward, because a lot of your equipment's going to be stamped with some of these abbreviations. And we want to, uh, we need to understand what they stand for. So the first thing you're going to go through is your uh, your WLL, which means working load limit. What this means is this is uh, this stands for the rated capacity um, that is going to be stamped on that piece of hardware. That is what the piece of equipment can hold and is rated for and can hold continuously. And it should never be exceeded. So if I say a piece of a, equipment like a shackle has a working load limit of 10,000 pounds, that means we can put 10,000 pounds on that shackle continuously. It's designed to hold that weight, but we should never exceed that. Um, if you see SWL, safe working load limit, it's the same thing as working load limit. It's just a, um, different, a different version of it, all right? The next thing we need to talk about is our minimum braking strength. What this means is all equipment um, for overhead lifting is gonna have a design factor built into it, some kind of safety factor, which we'll talk about in a minute. And um, there needs to be a range. So like I said, that same shackle had a working load limit of 10,000 pounds. It may have a minimum braking strength of 40,000 pounds, which means when they test that and they design it, it has to be able to hold 40,000 pounds before it fails. And we don't know after that 40,000 pounds exactly when it will break. It could be 40,000 one pound, it could be 42,000 pounds. We really don't know, but it has to hold at least 40 before it would fail or whatever number is assigned to that minimum braking strength. The safety factor, like I just mentioned, is basically a ratio between those two, all right? So if I say I have a minimum braking strength of 40,000 pounds and a working load limit of 10,000 pounds, I would divide the, the braking strength by the working load limit and that's gonna give me a ratio, which would be four to one, all right? And that's what's known as our safety factor or design factor, it may also be called, all right? Um, most or I should say all of your overhead rigging equipment are gonna have minimum safety factors that are set forth by ASME. For example, like your overhead lifting chains, it's mandated that they have a safety factor of, of four to one. And I would say four to one is the minimum for overhead lifting. Some of your synthetics, your synthetic slings and wire rope slings, it's mandated they have a safety factor of five to one. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. All of your tow equipment, when you start getting into your different grades of uh, chain and things that are designed for horizontal movement, not, not designed for overhead lifting are typically gonna only have a safety factor of three to one, which is one of the reasons we don't wanna use those for overhead lifting, but we'll get more into that in a little bit. All right. First things we're gonna go into as far as our equipment is we're gonna go into our overhead lifting slings, all right? Some people will call these overhead lifting slings. You may also hurt here the term recovery slings. Um, Overhead lifting kind of comes from the crane world and recovery is going to typically come from the tow world, which they have the ability and sometimes will do uh, work that kind of goes both ways. They're going to do a lot of basic towing and dragging horizontal stuff, but they're also going to do recovery work, which is basically overhead lifting with heavy vehicles and with, with your big uh, heavy wreckers and your rotators and things like that. But anytime we're doing any form of a of an overhead lift where that load is basically coming off the ground and is unsupported from underneath, we need to use equipment that's designed for that. So like I said, uh, overhead lifting versus recovery, we'll get in that in a minute, but you may hear these, uh, these slings uh, called both. And they could be a variation of any one of these things. You, you're gonna have chain slings, wire rope slings, and then your different types of uh, uh, synthetic slings, like your endless round slings, your flat web slings, and one of the newer things coming on the market is your synthetic chain, which is also a form of uh, synthetics, all right? These are all slings and they're all governed uh, that if they're designed for overhead, they're all gonna be governed by that OSHA regulation as well as ASME and all those requirements that they need to maintain and have is gonna be um, through ASME, all right? So we just kind of talked about this overhead lifting versus recovery slings, right? So any type of what it is, is essentially any, any rigging assembly used in order to lift or hoist a load in a vertical or overhead direction. 
like I said, these can be constructed of uh, all sorts of things, alloy steel chain, Dyneema synthetic chain, wire rope, synthetic fibers, or even metal mesh. Metal mesh, we don't see in the fire service uh, too much. It's it's very strong, but it's also very expensive. And um, you typically see that more of in an industrial setting in like uh, uh, steel yards and things like that. So they're, they're rated for high heat and things like that. So the assembly, the, uh, the sling assemblies can be made in a number of ways. However, they're made from the manufacturer. You can also go through a lot of manufacturers and have things made to fit whatever need you want. And they could have single, uh, be a single sling or contain multiple legs. They could have all sorts of uh, fasteners and different types of hooks and connections on them, as well as uh, connection points like uh, rings or oblong links or master links or any of that stuff. And some of those terms we'll talk about in a little bit. Overhead lift versus recovery. We kind of hit on this a little bit. Um, an overhead lift is any freely suspended or unsupported or unguided load lifted from a, or lower um, from an elevated point. So we don't do this too often in the fire service, but we do have the ability to do it. Typically when we're gonna see this is if we're working in some kind of USAR site, um, structural collapse, when we're utilizing cranes, rubble piles to lift objects and move them out of the way, uh, removing debris, uh, looking for victims, where we may have to be working under an unsupported elevated point, um, as well as fire service working uh, with heavy uh, vehicle accidents where that rotator or that heavy record may need to um, lift that, that, that heavy vehicle up over our head and kind of move or support the load and we may have to work underneath it. So the difference between uh, overhead lifting and recovery. Your recovery is uh, an advanced removal of a vehicle or an object, which may involve lifting, but it also may involve hoisting it, rolling it, and getting into some increased elevations and increased friction coefficients, because that's going to basically increase and add to the force that we're, that's being applied to our rigging and those systems. And that's kind of an advanced technique that we need to understand. That's why it's going to tie more into that recovery uh world versus just a basic tow where they're just kind of dragging a car onto a flatbed or out of the ditch or something like that. First uh, slings we're going to get into, we'll go through all the different uh, types of slings and how they're made. And the first ones we're going to talk about are our chain slings. So this is a good picture just showing you how your chain slings can be designed. It could be uh, a number of ways you could have your master link, which is that big ring on the top, which is the connection point. It could be a single leg uh, chain, a double, triple, or quadruple leg sling, depending on how you design, uh, have them made. You could have all sorts of different grab hooks or sling hooks attached to the bottom. And any chain that is designed for overhead lifting is going to be set to, with a certain grade. And that grade needs to be at, for overhead lifting is a minimum of 80, 80 or above, which is going to be grade 80, 100, or 120. And then if you're familiar with the chain grades, grade 70 is going to be your 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 tow chain or your transport chain which is not rated for overhead lifting it's going to be designed more for um like we talked about those horizontal movements and securing loads and binding things together and mirroring mirroring objects together and we'll talk about grade 70 in a little bit all right so some characteristics of chain all right like we just talked about the minimum grade for overhead lifting is 80 and then you're also going to have 100 and 120. Um, the higher the grade, the higher the strength. Some things that are mandated for OSHA, from OSHA for over uh, that overhead lifting chain has to have some characteristics it has to have. It's a, it's a minimum of a four to one safety factor, like we talked about a little bit ago. Um, another big thing, chain is kind of like uh, our cribbing in a way where you think about we typically try to use soft lumber as our cribbing because it gives us a lot of it talks to us. It gives us a lot of warning before as it's overloaded before it fails. It will it will pop and it will crack and creak and deflect and cup and do things like that. Your chain is designed for overhead lift. Overhead lifting chain is designed the same way. It's mandated by ASME that that chain will stretch 20% before it actually fails. Now there's no allowable stretch. So one of the things when you're going through inspecting your chain is when you purchase it, you want to uh, get a measurement of it and we'll tell you how to do that in a little, in a little bit, but you're going to kind of keep the measurement of that chain written down in your log. And as uh, you use it and inspect it, you'll continue to measure it to make sure that that measurement hasn't changed because that's a sign of elongation and chain that has been stretched needs to be removed from service. So there's no allowable stretch. But once that chain has started to overload, like once you're past that um, minimum breaking strength, it's going to st start stretching 
and elongating quite a bit before it fails. So it'll give you a lot of warning before it lets go. It's just not gonna blow apart uh, unexpectedly. All right, the other thing, not only chain, but all of your overhead lifting slings and equipment, they must have an uh, legible identification tag. And that tag is gonna have a bunch of things on there. Like I said, it needs to be uh, legible and it needs to be intact. It's going to have, it's going to tell you who made the chain, um, the grade of the chain, the diameter of the chain, the, the working load limit of the chain, um, you typically the length of the sling and some kind of serial or trace number. And it should have all that information on your tag. Um, me, um, a lot of your uh, manufactured multiple leg slings, like we talked about, we showed in those pictures where the, you, you saw a, a two, three or a four leg chain sling. Um, those ratings are based on all of your legs being loaded. So if you see, if you have a, uh, a two leg sling and it's got grade 80 chain on it or grade 100 chain, and it has a rating of 16,000, 17,000 pounds, whatever the rating may be, that's based on both of those legs being loaded. It's basically rated as an entire assembly. The only exception of that rule with chain is if you have a three or a four leg sling, the rating is only gonna be on three legs because remember chain is not designed to stretch unless it's overloaded. So there's really no given it. So if you have a four leg chain sling, three of those legs will be holding um, the load and that fourth leg is just giving you stability. It's just giving you stability of the load. So your rating from your three and your four leg chain slings will probably be the same by most manufacturers. All right, this is just a guy going through, uh, going through talking about your, uh, your different types of chain and like how they're graded. So we're going to, uh, Get into we'll, we'll talk about grade 70 a little bit versus, versus grade 80 100 and 120. the reason um grade 80 and above chain is going to be intended and designed for overhead lifting there's a few things so the big thing um the higher the grade the higher strength so it's giving you more strength so that would be one two is it stretching principles all right we already said 80 and above is mandated to stretch 20 percent before failure grade 70 and below are not um, and the reason for that is it's basically the steel that they're made out of. Your grade 70 chain is called is made is going to be made out of carbon steel, and your grade 80 and above uh, lip, overhead lifting chain is going to be made out of alloy steel. And alloy steel is what gives it that stretching those stretching properties that allow to elongate the way that it does. Like I said, grade grade 70 will stretch a little bit, but it's not going to stretch as much, and it's not mandated, so you don't really have those same properties. So as well as it's a safety factor that's built into it. Grade 70 chain is only mandated a three to one safety factor. There are manufacturers out there that make it to a four to one, but most of them are only typically three to one. Um, and then I, also your grade 80, your, your grade 80 and above will have a, it's alloy steel will have a high, higher working load limit and have those a bigger safety factor and have those stretching properties, which is why it is utilized for overhead lifting. All right. This is kind of just going into the strength of your grades. So all these chains here listed are all the exact same size, three eighths inch chain. And you can see how the uh, the working load limit will, will increase as the higher the grade. So your grade 70, three eighths is 6,600, 80, 71, 88 for 100. And then when you get in your 120, it's 10, six. Markings, most of your chain will be stamped from the manufacturer with a marking. So if you go through and every you know, five, five to six links, you're gonna see a, a stamp on one of them and it should be a indication of what grade your chain is made. So your grade 70, it may say G7, G70 or G700 and that's just referring to that, that grade 70 grade. Same thing with your 80 or 100 and 120. 120 is uh, pretty unique. Originally when a lot of it was coming out, it was all a square, a square link chain as an indicator and it was designed that way. So only grade 120 could be utilized with other grade 120 chain because if I took a 120 chain and hooked it into an 80, I'm only as strong as my weakest link. There are manufacturers now starting to make grade 120 with a round link style like the other chains because it's it's multifaceted. They can use it in a lot more uh, configurations and gives them the ability to do that. Just understand, like I said, you're only as strong as your weakest link. Um, if you notice the grade 70 chain is gold, 
Um, there's a misconception, not all grade 70 carbon steel chain is gold. That is a gold chromate finish that they put on there because that chain, typically the gold chain is designed for your, your toe and your, your transport chain, like we said, securing loads to flatbeds and things like that, where it's subjected to the weather uh, elements, snow, mud, water, things like that. And that finish is put on there to help um, protect that chain. Because your metals are different between carbon steel and alloy steel, um, that gold finish, you're typically not going to see it on alloy steel chain because it could actually prematurely degrade the chain over time. What you're going to see is a lot of your overhead lifting chain that they use like in the, the tow world for the recovery work. It's going to be powder coated like the uh, grade 120 that chain there and that picture is powder coated blue. You see a lot of manufacturers starting to make it like neon yellow and neon green and things like that, which is called high vis chain, which is nice because it's that song chain it's protected from the elements and it's also visible at night your identification tag we've kind of hit on this like i said mandated by your osha regulation 1910-184 and all those things we talked about size grade rated capacity reach number of sling legs and your serial number all that stuff um including the manufacturer's name is going to need to be on that tag one thing about your tags and i do get this question quite a bit and this will go um and this applies to all your slings, but where you typically run into it is with chain and potentially wire rope. A lot of people will ask um, if my tag gets damaged or worn out or broken off of my chain, can I buy a replacement tag and just engrave the information on that tag? Cause you can go on the internet or you can go through rigging, uh, rigging suppliers and you can buy blank tags and you would be able to put that information on here and retag your chain. The issue with that becomes, and it's mentioned actually uh, in the OSHA standard, and it, it discusses this, that the last person that altered that chain is now the manufacturer. So if your chain is broken off and you buy a blank tag and engrave it and put it, put it on there, um, you are now the manufacturer of that chain and not the true manufacturer who made the chain. Just so, so for liability purposes, just be aware of that. Um, you can have your, your chain and your sling sent back to your manufacturer and they can do a proof test on them and they will retag it. But my personal opinion for what that would cost and the time it would take to have that done, you'd probably be just better off buying a new section of chain and probably have it back sooner. But the, uh, the more we take care of our equipment and the better we maintain it and protect our tags, the longer it stays in service. And like I said, these are tools for us to make our job easier and to help uh, potentially save people and taxpayers and things like that that have put us in our, this position that we're in so just take care of your equipment and just be mindful of the importance of your tags if you uh, if you do um take a chain out of service for a tag issue and no, there has been no damage to the chain itself um, it can be used as like utility chain and things like that it just should not be used for overhead lifting all right, we talked earlier about uh, snapping a measurement on your chain when it's purchased and keeping that in your log. When that chain is measured, it should be com pulled completely tight so there's no slack in the chain to give you a false measurement. And you wanna measure from bearing point to bearing point. If you notice where the tape measure is in that picture, your bearing point here would be the inner portion of your hook to the inner upper portion of your master link. Basically anticipate if I were to load this chain, what are the two points that would be supporting load on either end? And those are your bearing points. Here's a picture of like measuring your bearing point where you would measure and what the bearing point is. Like I said, a portion of the lifting sling that are intended to hold the load, which is typically the inner center of your hook and or the longest axis of your master link. Your master link, some also people may call them an oblong link. Understand they're, they're designed to be pulled in the long, the long uh, direction, not side loaded uh, from the shorter axis. So that's where you would measure from. And if you have two hooks on either end, same thing. You measure from those inner portions of both hooks and those would be your bearing points. And you wanna make sure like with different crews and different shifts that everybody's on page. Cause if you have multiple people that are going through and measuring and inspecting your chain and they're not measuring from the same spot, obviously your, your measurements are going to be different and you may have people wanting to remove or get rid of chain that isn't necessarily been stretched or overloaded. Just the lack of communication. Uh, chain inspection, going through all of these different things. Like if you said any worn links, gouged links, if it's been heated up and you see signs of heat damaged, if it's been stretched or elongated in any way, if you have any bent links, 
or any weld splatter, which typically doesn't apply for the fire department, more of a construction standard or an industry standard, but you see any of those things. Also, if it's been heavily uh, rusted or oxidized or corroded, any, any of those things, the chain should be removed from service. Getting into your hooks. So that remember, ASME has a specific standard just designed on the hooks. And these are some of the different types of hooks you may see on your chain. And like, you can have your chain manufactured and set up however you'd like, whatever length you want, with a number of different types of hooks designed on uh, what you feel for your area and what you run is and your equipment works best for you. So you can have your like your your sl sling hooks with your latch, your typical grab hooks, which we'll talk about heavily in a minute, which are probably the most popular in the fire service. Uh, an open-ended foundry hook, which is basically is similar to your sling hook. It just doesn't have your locking latch on it. And then you also have your self-locking uh, sling hooks or latch hooks, which you see quite a bit in the fire service, either on the end of chain or a lot on the end of your winch lines. And then your uh, your component connector, some people call it a coupler, but that's that basically that hinge piece that's going to hook your chain to a master link or a connection point and give it the ability to adjust and equalize. So these are all the components that you may or may not see on your sling, your chain slings, right? So a terminology thing, a clevis hook, some people refer to a lot of hooks as clevis hooks. All the clevis um, means is that it, it's based on the connection point. So I have one right here. If you take a look at this, this portion right here is the clevis where basically the link would drop through and then it would be pinned. All right. And that's how the, the, the chain is assembled. And that's when you hear the word clevis hook, that's all it's referring to. You can get any style of hook as a clevis hook. The other option would be like this would be your eye hook. It's a round hook, um, round opening on the end of the hook like so. And that link would come through at the, when they manufacture it and the link would be welded around your hook. So all that really does, uh, talks about is how the hooks are manufactured and how they're going to come assembled and hooked to your chain when they come from the manufacturer. And like I said before, you can get any type of any style of hook um, as a round hook or, or uh, not a round hook, an eye hook. I'm sorry. Eye hook or a clevis hook. All right. Sling hooks. All right, they have, like I said, they have their own standard through ASME and there's some things that are mandated by them. So the hook itself doesn't have to be stamped with a with a rating. It's typically just gonna have the grade and the size and may tell you three eighths inch or half inch with a G8 or a G100 or whatever um, grade is designed to it, all right? The throat opening can't stretch more than 5% or a quarter inch. So that hook is actually allowed to be stretched and elongated a little bit, my personal opinion. If your hook has been stretched at all for the amount that we use them and for what they cost, I personally would take it out of service, but it is allowed a little bit of movement in there per ASME. Um, one thing we need to understand, like I said, with our grab hooks, um, as far as proper use, your grab hooks lose 20% of the slings capacity in a choker un un unless it's equipped with cradles. So talking about how the hook is designed. So I have one right here. So if you have this hook here, this is your typical grab hook. And anytime this chain comes back on that link, like a choker, like so, that is going to be a 20% reduction unless your hook has these cradles right here. Some people call that, refer to them as shoulders. And there's a picture of this in a minute. What that, what these do is this gives the, uh, the hook the ability to maintain full surface contact with that link. So you're not losing any of your chain's capacity. If your hook is not equipped with these shoulders or cradles, anytime you put it back on itself and hook it into a link, you're losing 20% of your capacity, all right? Um, and that plays into a lot of what we do and a lot of people don't realize that. ASME does not require a safety latch on your hooks, but if the hook is equipped with one from the manufacturer, it does need to be operable, all right? And there's a picture right there, your cradles versus your non-cradle hook and cradle like we just talked about. The cradle will maximize that surface contact that that hook has with the link, keeping you at full capacity. All right. Getting into your wire rope slings. Like I said, same thing. These can be me a number of ways. They can be made with multiple leg uh, sling configurations with master links. You may have hooks uh, fastened to the ends of them. It may just be a straight uh, sling with just your uh, op your eyes on the end, where like, which is basically how those are designed. Is that sling is bent back on itself, uh, especially with the machine, and then it's coupled back to itself, giving you a lifting eye on either end, all right? So these can be made a number of, a number of ways as well. 
All right, so things that go in with your wire rope slings, they're mandated at a five to one safety factor as well as your synthetics. So they have an even bigger safety range, all right? Um, wire rope slings in your synthetic, like we talked about with the chain, those three and four leg sling ratings are going to be the same with chain because that chain is not going to move or stretch at all unless it's been overloaded. Uh, your wire rope will have some give to it and your synthetics are obviously made of either polyester or nylon and they're gonna have some stretch to it just like your life safety rope. So when you load them, that load will stretch those legs and allow all legs to equalize and bear a portion of the load. So you will see different ratings from a three and a four leg sling on leg chain. Just like everything else, must have a legible ID tag attached and that tag's gonna have all that same information, length, number of legs, um, diameter, rating, uh, who made it and some kind of trace or serial number. All right, and we talked about this may have wire rope eyes or contain steel master links and hooks on the end. However, it's however you have it designed from the manufacturer or however the manufacturer designed it and you just purchased it. All right, there's a picture of your tag, all those things that the tag may have, just like a uh, chain needs to be legible and it needs to be attached. And if it's not, it should be removed from service. All right, wire rope construction. So Essentially, we talked about chain having the different types of grades. Uh, wire rope is kind of made the, way, the same way, except for it's listed as the type of steel it's made, which out of which will be improved plow steel. And they basically just keep extending it out as it gets stronger. So you'll have extra improved plow steel and extra extra improved plow steel. So the, the higher the plow steel, the, the higher the rating that the, uh, the wire rope will have. All right. Um, there are all sorts of different types of construction. So when you buy it, it's going to be numbered uh, like you see, like a one by seven or a one by 19. And those numbers, what they represent is that first number is going to represent the number of, uh, of overall strands. And then each one of those strands is going to be made up of smaller wires. And that second number is, represents the number of wires in each strand. So there's all sorts of different wire rope in there. And it's made in all sorts of different configurations based on what it's designed for based on the, the type of sling or whether it's wire rope you utilize for cranes or winches or anything like that. So um, you can, there's a lot of wire rope that's made for specific purposes and jobs and that's gonna determine a lot of these numbers. All right. Just like your synthetic rope that you use in Life Rescue, your wire rope's gonna have some form of core and you're, you may see a, um, a fiber core which is made out of uh, typically polypropylene and it's basically great for flexibility and it's very lubricant resistant. So it bends quite well. And we'll talk about um, bending a little bit more when we get into some uh, DD ratio stuff. And same thing, you could have a straight wire strand core, which is basically just another, of those wire strands that kind of wrap around the outside. It's gonna have another one of those middle that acts as its own core. And I would say that's, uh, it's very simple and it's very cost effective and it, it's suitable for small small diameter rope, which is typically what you'll see with a lot of your wire rope slings and your winch cables. And then you also might have an independent wire core, which is um, it's great because it's great for crushing. So something where that, that cable might be compressed or crushed, it's, it's very resistant to that. And also as well as distortion. And um, it gives you a, a longer life. It doesn't fatigue as easily. So dependent on how you, uh, what you're purchasing the wire rope for will then determine the type of core. And like I said before, how it's made. I would say your wire strand core is gonna be typical for most of your basic wire rope slings or your basic uh, winch lines, but you may have independent wire cores based on the manufacturer or your fiber cores as well. All right, wire rope blades. So if you pick up a piece of wire rope and you take a look at it and you're gonna see those, those strands and those wires and they're gonna be wrapped a certain way. And depending on what that wire rope is designed to do and what it's designed for is going to determine how the rope is laid. And uh, right, re uh, right regular lay is the most common for uh, your standard slings, which would be the one on the top left there. And that basically means that the wires in each strand are wrapped in a right direction. And then the strands wrapped overall around the core are wrapped in the right direction. You might see all that stuff alternate based on what it's designed for. Talking about what a rope lay is, so as that strand wraps around one full time, that's considered one uh, rope lay. And you can go through your uh, your inspection criteria, and if you see a certain number of smaller wires broken in a certain number of uh, lays, that's going to determine when that, if or when that rope needs to be removed from service. All right. So 
basically when that rope wraps one full time around the core, that's considered one rope lip. Some things you may see that are going to uh, are caused to have take your wire rope out of service, whether it's a sling or a winch cable. All right. Um, any broken wires, like I said, there's a set number on that. If you see a couple small wires here and there, it's not the end of the world. But if there's a substantial number, typically it's a five on one rope lay. Or if you have more than 10 wire random broken through the to the length of the of the wire rope, it should be removed from service. Any big uh, war, uh, abrasions or warm wires, bird caging. If you see that uh, that those wires start to kind of space out and get bigger and bulge and separate, that's called bird caging. And once that happens, the uh, the wire rope's done. Um, if you see the core starting to pull through and pop out of the center of the uh, the exterior wire rope. Or, um, that should be removed from service. Major damage to your fittings, if you have like your, your fixed eyes on your sling, should be taken out. And any big kinks, anytime you kink a wire, it's going to weaken it. No different than like when you bend rope back on itself to tie a knot, all that stuff weakens it. It's You're doing the same thing to your wire open. But once that kink is in there, you're never uh, you're never going to get it out. And it's, it's kind of done at that point. You should be removed from service because you're not going to get the same strength out of it as you expect. Right. So your coupler, like with, if you do have lifting slings, wire rope lifting slings, and they have those coupled eyes on the end, if you have any break, broken wires protruding from the edge of that eye, they should be removed from service. All right. Get into your synthetic slings. All right. Same thing. They're going to two different style, well, actually three different styles. Now, typically what you see is your endless round slings like you have on the left and then your flat web style slings. Um, the flat web style be careful with those because you do have ones designed for overhead lifting. And then you also have some basic toe ones that people refer to as toe straps that are designed for like um, four by four in, in Jeep applications and things like that. They're not really intended for overhead lifting. So depending on what you're buying your straps for and what you plan on using them for, make sure that you're purchasing and utilizing the right equipment because it can be confusing. The new thing on the market that you're seeing some people running with uh, synthetic uh, chain and basically what is it's made out of uh, Dyneema fibers, which is also Dyneema is very, very pliable and it's very, very strong. It's also being utilized for a lot of your winch cables and we'll get to that in a little bit, but you may see out this out there and it's going to have your, uh, your metal hooks and your metal fittings on, on the end. The cool thing about this is you can actually take it and shorten it and hook it back through the middle of links to shorten it or, uh, make a uh, basket connections and things like that. And, uh, it's new on the market. Just be mindful. Um, some of the manufacturers that make this, they do make some that are designed at a four to one safety factor for overhead lifting. And then they make some that are designed at a two to one safety factor. And they're just basically designed for transport purposes. And they look identical. They're not like color coded or anything like that, unless it's changed since last I've seen it. But just be mindful if you do decide to purchase this, make sure you're buying the right stuff to utilize it for the right application that you plan on using it for. All right, get in into your synthetics. We hit on this already. You're going to be looking at a, a mandated five to one safety factor, so they're very, very strong. Uh, just like everything else, must have a legible identification tag, and it's going to have all that state, same stuff on there. The big difference with this tag is on top of manufacturer and width and length and material and trace number, and it's going to give you ratings on um, three configurations, your typical sling configurations. It's going to have the rating based on a, a straight or a vertical hitch, um, a basket hitch and then a choker, choker being the weakest, and you'll see a picture of that in the middle. All right. Um, thing to note, depending on what your sling is made out of, it could be made out of nylon or polyester, and they both have their pros and cons. Poly polyester is resistant to acids, but not but also degrades in um alkalis, and nylon is the opposite. So just be mindful if you plan on doing any certain thing with this. Like I said, I don't know how much this really applies to us in the fire service, but just a uh, note to self. Your endless round slings are basically, you don't want to see any exposed uh, core fibers. So it's going to have an inner and outer jacket. And if you have that jacket and you see, start to see, like this one has been heavily torn, but if you start to see these inner fibers, this is what gives you all the strength. If you have tears on this outer jacket and you start to see these fibers exposed, it should be removed for serv from service. Same thing if your tag is worn or starting to uh, get ripped off where you can't read it anymore. Um, needs to be taken out of service. So do a good job and just pay attention to your tags when you're rigging it and try not to rub it on abrasive sharp edges and have it facing up and you can get more longevity out of your slings. 
All right, your flat web slings, you don't want to see any big uh, cuts, tears, rips, broken stitching in them. And you, especially with any of your synthetics, you don't want to see any knots. Knots will weaken them faster than anything else. You can probably cut your sling in half and it would still hold more weight, more weight than if you put a knot in and allow that knot to cinch on itself. It's going to weaken your sling the most. Uh, your endless round slings are going to be uh, color coded by the manufacturer based on strength. So like an example here is I have this purple one here. I can buy this purple sling and it's going to have this 5,000 pound rating for this purple one or whatever color you buy. And it doesn't matter if this is one foot or 50 foot, it's going to be that same rating and same diameter, just a different length. And then all your colors will coincide with a different thickness and a different rating. And you can buy all those different colors in whatever length suitable for what you're trying to use it for. Um, just be mindful. I don't, I'm not positive, but I don't believe all manufacturers have standard colors. I think the color system is based on the person making the sling. All right. And you, they'll, uh, a lot of your manufacturers will give you like ID cards like this, which are great reference cards. And it's going to show you the rating for all of your different colors, endless round slings. And then what it does when it's in a choker and when it's in a basket and, all the lengths and all that other stuff, the trace numbers, all that information you need based on the color coding of their, their color coding system. All right. And we hit on this already. ID tag should manufacturer's name, code or serial number. Uh, number. Um, but the big difference is it's going to have that rated load for your hitches, your straight, your choker, your basket. Straight may also be called vertical. All right. And whatever it's made out of, whether it's dyneema, polyester, or nylon. And... Um, some slings, the core may be made out of a different material than the outer jacket. If that is the case, you, you may see that on your tag if you're ever looking at your tag and you wonder what that means. Here's an indication of your different hitches and how your tag may work. And like I said, minimum of five to one, there are a lot of manufacturers that make their stuff to a, an even higher safety factor. If you look at this tag right there, it's at, the sling's actually made to a seven to one safety factor. So um, very, very big range. Uh, any of these things like we hit on, uh, like I said, knots are really bad. If your sling is um, manufactured with metal components or couplers or hooks or rings or anything like that, they need to kind of abide by the same standards. You know, make sure they're not rusted, bent, uh, twisted, corroded. Like, like I said, big snags. If it's really worn out, uh, um, illegible tag or removed tag, knots any uh, metal or material that's been embedded in the sling, all of those things, any real bad UV damage, um, any of those things are all meet, all meet that criteria where it should be removed from service. All right. Now that we've gone into a lot of our, our slings and how they're designed and why they're designed the way they're made and how they're made, we're going to actually start getting into some information, some best practices and proper use techniques to go along with them. All right. So talking about our critical sling angles. All right. So anytime we're using a sling, angles play into everything that we're doing. The wider the angle, the more stress that that sling is going to be seen. It's very similar to your uh, your anchor calculations that may, you may use in a rope rescue. All right. So if you look at the far left, I have a basket. Baskets typically will double my capacity. I should say typically they do double your capacity, but it's based on the angle of those legs. As they come vertical, um, theoretically, each leg is holding half 50% of the load. So a thousand pound load, each one of those legs would be holding 500 pounds. And from like zero to 10 degrees, that's typically the case. As that angle starts to get wider, the more weight is going to be applied to those sling legs based on the load and the tension that's put be put that's being put on it based on the, the severe angle you get on it. And you can just see as the angle gets wider, um, the more force. So basically once you get to 120, 120 is kind of that magic number where we say everything's equal. So if you had an overall angle of 120, then and with that same thousand pound load, each leg, each one of those slings on each side is holding a thousand pounds between the load and the tension being applied to it. So, like I said, just like your, your anchor attachments, if, if, if you just imagine that that thousand pound load was now your anchor and those two legs were holding your, your load, the tension you're being, that's being applied to them works the exact same way. The best thing I can say with this as we move forward, a lot of people don't understand. I see a lot of people doing these classes and stuff like that. 
They have all their numbers and their physics and their angles, and they're great when it comes to rope rescue. But for whatever reason, it doesn't transfer over, and they they don't apply it the same way to uh, to heavy lifting and heavy rigging. Um, principles are principles, and physics are physics. You can't defy them, and if you just understand that, it's all the same stuff. I, I always say that a uh, a winch cable going through a snatch block with a uh, a shackle and a piece of chain is no different than a rope going through a pulley with a carabiner and a piece of webbing. The physics that apply to the rope rescue are the same physics that are applied to this equipment. It's just bigger, beefier, heftier stuff. That's all it is. All right, so sling tension, we kind of get into this. So zero to 10 degrees, we just talked about 50% per leg. And as that angle widens, um, the weight on that, each sling leg is going to increase. So just for easy memory, if you just look at something, your, this is your overall angle coming off from your hook. So from zero to 10 degrees, it's gonna be 50% per leg. At 90 degrees, it's 75%. And at 120 degrees, it's 100% uh, per leg. Anything above that is not recommended, all right? Triangulating a sling should be avoided because the tension will basically, when you start pulling on that, it's going to pull that load in two different directions. And we have a picture of that right here. So you can see when you kind of bring that through and kind of create a true triangle like you do on the left, as we load, those anchors are gonna start and those connection points are gonna to start to be pulled in two different directions and they're prematurely gonna fail because they kind of wanna collapse on themselves. Where if you just grab that middle section of that sling, brought it up to your connection point, now you're pulling in line and it's much more suitable for what you're asking it to do. And it's gonna be much stronger. All right, if you ever wanted to calculate uh, your sling tension, it's a basic formula. Um, I'm very simplistic. I don't expect people to be out there doing this on the scene. Just understand. That's why if you can just remember your overall angles, like I said, zero degrees, 90 degrees, 120 degrees, you can kind of just take a look at something and know what ballpark you're in. But if you want to play with it, this is how that, how to calculate your sling tension. And it's a basic formula. You're just going to take your vertical height from the load to your connection point, the overall length of the sling, and then 50% of the load, and that's going to tell you what each side, each sling on is going to be, what tension and load it's going to be holding based on the configuration that you put it in, all right? There is a formula here that we'll get to in a minute that is um, for an oblong object. We'll talk about that in a little bit, all right? And this kind of goes into your uh, synthetic and wire rope slings. We talked about this already that they will distribute um, and that load will transfer among four legs because they have the ability to stretch and equalize a little bit where chain does not you basically if this was a chain sling three of those chain legs are going to be holding um all the weight that fourth one is just giving you stability allowing it allowing the load to kind of balance the load and where you have it rigged to all right hitches um your, your three basic hitches we talked about, your vertical, your basket, and your choker. Understand chokers are the weakest. They're typically going to lose 20%. And when we talked about the uh, the benefit of the cradled hooks, when you, uh, the cradled grab hooks utilizing chain, when you hook it back on itself, um, typically it's a 20% reduction. As long as you have those cradled hooks, you'll keep yourself at full capacity. But when you get into your synthetics or your wire rope, anytime you run it back on itself and choke through it, you're going to lose 20% of your capacity, all right? And then your baskets are typically going to double as long as your legs are coming up vertically. If you make it too tight of a basket and those connection points at the top are at a real drastic angle, you need to uh, look at your uh, sling chart and just understand that you're putting more load on it. You're going to overload it sooner. All right. So we talked about baskets going to give you 200% capacity as long as your legs are 10 degrees or less. Straight, the rating on that sling is in that straight vertical uh, capacity. So if I say a sling, if you see a sling that's tagged with a 5,000 pound working load limit, that's going to be in a straighter vertical pull. And then that's the number that they will use to your basket would be 10,000 pounds. And then you'd subtract 20% off of that if you were in a choker. All right. Going into our chokers, everything is based on angles with these as well. So your choke reduction we talked about 20 to 25%, depending on whether it's uh, synthetics, wire rope or chain, is going to be at a choke angle of around 120. As that choke angle, actually, you start pulling more on a side direction. If that angle decreases and gets back, starts coming back on itself, that choke reduction is going to multiply. So this is just a, basically a chart showing you how much you're actually, what your rate of capacity is and what you're actually losing with wire rope. 
with a more narrow, the, the more narrow your choke angle gets. It's not just an always 20% and you can actually make it way worse if you aren't paying attention to what you're doing or you start pulling on it in, in the, uh, the wrong direction. The other thing is depending on the friction that the sling has with the object, the more back, uh, back direction you pull, it might bite up and then you overload it. And if that sling wants to spin, it's going to shock load the overall system and could cause bigger problems. Load charts, um, a lot of manufacturers out there, will, uh, like Crosby and things like that, will give you nice small laminated load charts and they're great to uh, keep in your back pocket. You'll see a lot of uh, heavy riggers within the crane industry and stuff like that will carry these because it's no one's expecting you to, to memorize all these numbers and remember all this stuff in your head, but just being able to find it and reference it really quick is good. And having these charts in there showing you all your different angles and your chokers and basically what size sling you're using and just quick quickly reference it and see the increase or decrease load on it based on what you're doing. Really good uh, tools to keep. All right, DD ratio. This is uh, very, very important. That another thing that a lot of people don't realize. Um, what DD ratio is, it's a ratio between the diameter of the object that you're wrapping and the diameter of the sling itself. And if you look it up, it's going to be uh, displayed just like it is in the heading there. The capital D represents the diameter of the object and the lowercase d represents the diameter of the sling. All of your, I shouldn't say all of your, most of your slings are going to have a DD ratio. So chain slings have a DD ratio of six to one. That means the object you wrap your chain around has to be at least six times the diameter of the chain itself to get full capacity out of it. Just like in rope, when we bite rope back on itself or put it in a really tight pulley or something like that, it, it decreases its rating because of the bends and the, the friction that we're putting into it and, and the minimal amount of surface contact. So everything here is based on surface contact. Wire rope slings have a DD ratio of 25 to one, which is very, very big because they don't bend. We talked about earlier, like they want to kink and birdcage real easily. So they want a nice big gradual bend and a lot of surface contact with the object to maintain full capacity. All right. Um, DD ratio for wire rope slings is not the same as your wire rope that is intended to be, which is utilized in winches. Your winch DD ratio, and we'll talk about winches in a little bit, is typically going to be somewhere between 12 and 15 to 1. So for uh, just a, a reference, if you had a half inch winch cable, you'd want a pulley size, a sheath size of somewhere between 6 to 8 inches which would be ideal. They're a little bit more pliable based on how they're designed because they're designed to pull and, and be utilized that way. Also, if you have a wire rope sling that has those pre-manufactured eyes on the end, those eyes are bent um, a certain way by a machine and coupled back on themselves. The DD ratio of the eye is one to one. So if you have a half inch eye, you can put a half inch shackle through the eye and be totally fine and be, be at full capacity. Just the, the sling itself in the middle you want to wrap that object around something at least 25 times the size to get the full capacity out of it. And the tighter that object gets, the closer you're going to get to actually kinking the sling. And then it's going to be out of service because once it's kinked, you'll never get that kink out of it. Um, synthetics, um, they do not have a, a, uh, a DD ratio because they're so pliable. They really want to kind of bend back on themselves. Like they want to kind of come right back easily and you're not really losing any rating. The issue with these becomes when you when you start like collecting them in shackles or connection points and people want to just bunch them up, bunching and uh, twisting becomes your, your problem. So like so, you start looking at your synthetics and when you start jamming them up inside of shackles and squeezing them together and pinching them, that's, going to, that's when you're really going to derate them and cause problems. They do make accessories for these that kind of help with that. So these are some things you can get, uh, you can purchase to go along with your uh, your synthetic slings. You have your uh, like a round sling shackle. So your endless round sling will go in there and it'll stay nice and wide. You can use them for flat, uh, flat web slings as well. And then you also have your metal connection points for your flat web slings. They drop in there and your, your, your endless round, round slings as well. They'll drop in there and it keeps them nice and flat without bunching them up. It keeps you at full capacity. And then they make your, uh, your flat web sling shackles, which a lot of times it's just dropped through with a, a bolt and a cotter pin. All right, so all different stuff out there to kind of help fix those problems. The, the hooks in the middle are great, especially if you need to extend a sling out. You can use your regular shackles as well, like I said, as long as they're not being um, bunched up severely. But you don't ever want to girth hitch 
synthetics back through another one because it creates that stinching problem where they just want to dig into each other and that's going to be your foul point and it's going to be really really uh, a lot weaker than the stamp rating on it if you start doing something like that so if you have the ability to make hard connections between the two of them that is ideal all right we're going to start moving into a lot of our heavy rigging equipment and our hardware talking about um, our master links and our shackles and snatch blocks and things like that and talk about what those are and some of the uh the mandated information and stuff that goes along with them just like we did with our slings all right so uh any piece of uh heavy rigging hardware like i said any, it's an auxiliary piece of equipment and it could be anything from a from a, a shackle to a master link snatch block a hook the sw swivel hoist rings and whatever else you can think of that can be utilized with your overhead uh lifting slings all right Getting into shackles, um, a couple of a lot of different manufacturers out there. Some things with our shackles, uh, the ones you're seeing here, are screw pin shackles, which is what you see primarily in the fire service because they're easy to kind of just thread them in and take them off. Um, once you start getting into your bolt style, where you have like a nut on the other end and a cotter pin, for what we do in the fire service, if I need to connect one of these quickly or unconnect it quickly, they're not very practical. But you may see them. Some will have a, a, a you might see some with a nut that threads on. And then has a spring loaded or a clip loaded a cotter pin where it's a little easier to get out they're a little little bit more user friendly but the screw pin style that you see here are typically what you're going to see all right getting into the anatomy of it a little bit and these are all your different points and the things you want to look for the wear points you're checking when you're inspecting your shackles um the round part on the top is known as the bow and um that's your connection point the benefit to a shackle is when you hook sling legs in there if I just took a, a chain and dropped it through some kind of sling hook or grab hook, your hooks are rated for an, on your chain are rated for an overall of 90 degrees where a shackle is rated at, at an overall angle of 120 degrees. So now I can basically make a straight inline connection from one end to my shackle with my chain or my sling and then hook multiple slings off the shackle and I have a wider range and a wider angle that that uh, shackle gives me to stay at full capacity. All right, um, things that go into our shackles, they're going to be made from carbon steel or super carbon steel or alloy steel, and the rating on the shackle will be uh, um, designed, uh, the rating will be based on what steel that the shackle is made out of. Understand that uh, a different thing we, we talked about before that our, our, uh, our overhead lifting chain is made out of alloy steel and your transport chain is made out of carbon steel. Your carbon steel set shackles, are, they are intended and designed for overhead lifting. Just uh, be mindful of that. Shackle size, if you the list of size is based on the diameter of the bow itself, not the pin. So when I look at one, um, so if I look at this right here, this is my bow. So the diameter of the shackle is going to be based on this, and my pin is typically going to be a different diameter. So this, uh, my pin here, this is what determines the diameter of my shackle, and this is that 120 degree window we were talking about here. And um, the, the shackle should be stamped and it should be legible and it's gonna be stamped with the manufacturer's name, the rated loads, the size, and the material that it's made out of. And then you're also gonna see a marking on the side of the pin and it's typically probably gonna be um, stamped with an HS which represents high strength. Even your uh, carbon steel and your different, your, your super carbons, your alloy steel shackles, they're gonna be made out of different material but most manufacturers will utilize all their pins will be made the same. So the rating will be based on the shackle itself. All right. Um, Crosby shackles, they put a side load indicator on there. So I just talked about your overall angle of 120 degrees and people see a 45 on either side and they're like, well, if I do the math, that's a 90 degree angle. And that guy said they were rated at 120 degrees. What that 45 represents, like I said before, it's a side load indicator. So if I look at this shackle and I see the 45 on here, it tells me if I pull on the shackle in one direction, once I get to 45 degrees, at 45 degrees, my rating drops from 100% to 70%. And once I start pulling completely sideways on this, it drops it down to 50%. And that is not ideal, but that's what that indicator means. If you have to start pulling in one direction, it's letting you know when you're getting close to starting to uh, derate your shackle due to the side load that you're putting on it. Well, do's and don'ts with shackles like we just talked about 90 degrees from horizontal 50 percent in line at zero degrees that's where your full rating is and at 45 degrees you're at 70 percent so not uh side loading not advised 
like I said, it does give you a rating. And for whatever reason you feel like you have to do it, there is a rating there. Just understand that you're cutting your shackle capacity in half. All right. At that overall 20, 120 degrees. So you can see the hook above it. If I were to hook those slings directly into that hook, that hook has an overall angle of 90 degrees. So by keeping the hook at zero degrees, now the shackle gives me a wider, wider window to maintain 100%. Also, notice the 30 degree there. All right, this is can get confusing. In the fire department, we typically reference everything based off of our angles that we are taught in rope. And I know a lot of departments and a lot of rope rescue, we utilize that overall angle of a 120. Well, in the rigging world, a lot of times they'll rate their equipment and you'll see angles based off the, the sling angle that it has, the horizontal angle the sling has with the load itself. So they're saying the same thing. So you may say, um, like we talked about at 120 degrees, everything's equal. So in this angle here, the sling has 100% um, of the load as well as the other sling. And then so at 30 degrees, if my overall angle is 120, my horizontal angle would be 30 on each side because everything equals 180, right? So if I had a 45 degree angle at the top, you know, 45, 45, 45. So if you see something referencing a sh an, air an angle and you're like, that math doesn't make sense. They may be talking about that horizontal angle, not the overall angle. Some things to get in with shackles, all right? Um, try not to, like I said, try to load them evenly so they're not hanging and side loaded. If you're going to have some type of uh, dynamic thing running through it, um, don't allow that dynamic moving sling or rope or whatever you're using to be on the pin side because it could potentially either it's going to do one of two things. It's going to lock it up so tight it won't be able to get it undone. Or if the thread's going the other direction, it's going to unthread it on you potentially. So like on the, the middle picture there, try to have the hook on the pin because that's going to be a static pull point and then if those, if those slings were to move or that load was to shift, being on the pin, it could uh, it's going to unthread the pin on you. All right. Shackles, you can use shackles, and it's uh it comes it happens quite a bit where you need to change the configuration of something. But so you can absolutely hook a shackle to another shackle to change the position that something's sitting in. Just when you're doing it, it is acceptable to be bow to bow, and it is acceptable to be pin to bow. But what you don't want to do is be pin to pin. Like so because when I do this, these really want to bind and they're not going to equalize. So that is not recommended. All right. Um, carabiners. Like I said, we've kind of talked a lot about rope rescue throughout this thing because a lot of the physics and the numbers and stuff kind of transfer over. Carabiners are designed to be loaded along their, their vertical axis, the long axis, and they are not designed to be pulled in all sorts of different directions, which potentially may happen in overhead lifting. So a lot of companies I see, they want to take their old steel carabiners and their old pulleys and they kind of use them for a lot of heavy lifting and moving. Me personally, I would recommend not doing that. Shackles are basically the carabiners of the heavy rigging world. Like we talked about, they're big, they're beefy, they're designed to be pulled over a 120 degree window. And there's a lot more surface contact that the shackle has with the objects you're putting it through like uh, snatch blocks. Use the right equipment for the right job. I know these things have a high rating in a certain configuration but the potential of overloading them or put, putting that rating outside of its con proper configuration is a lot more likely in the heavy rigging world. So I would not recommend using carabiners in replace of shackles. All right. Master links like we have here, just a big tool connection point. You may see these with chain shorteners built into them. You may see smaller links onto them as connection points for chain, or you may have them just by themselves. Very, very strong. And then this area here, just like the shackle, it can be loaded up to 120 degrees. So that's another benefit. We can also use these to hook multiple slings too to create our own bridle if we need to. Um, as well as, as long as you have a master link that coincides with the diameter hook that you have, if I have hooks without those cradles, I could hook them in here and it gives me the ability to pull completely in line, maintaining full capacity of my chain so I don't have to basket or and, and choke it back on itself around the link. I can hook straight into the link. So it gives me the, benefit, the ability to do that. So very, very uh, universal tool. All right, and we talked about 120 degree overall angle along the vertical axis. They, we don't want to, just like the shackle, we don't want to pull sideways on these. We want to pull them in line like this, all right? When utilizing the non-cradle grab hooks, the full working load of the sling is regained. We just talked about that. 
Um, identification markings, just like everything else, it's going to have a trademark in the manufacturer's name. It's going to have the traded rated load and the size and grade of the steel. So like this tells me that yoke made it, it's stamped. It's a grade 100. It's, you know, five eighths inch and it has a rating of 10,000 pounds or whatever the rating is going to be stamped on there. Swivel hoist rings, very, very valuable tool. Um, typically utilized with wedge anchors. And if you have rotary hammers, it gives you the ability to drill a hole in concrete and create a very, very strong anchor point somewhere quickly. And we have one here. The benefit to these is, like I said, it gives me the ability. It will it will equalize up to 100 degree, 180, degree, 180 degrees and it will also rotate 360 degrees. So it allows the kind of those slings or whatever I'm pulling off of to go wherever they need to go to keep it full capacity. The big thing is I want to make sure that I don't have an edge that this thing's binding on. I want it to be able to swivel and rotate completely. No side load on it, same thing. These are gonna tell you who made them, rating, what they're made out of, and it's typically gonna have a, a, a torque value on there, what they should be torqued to, to get the, the proper strength out of them. And they may have their own bolt through them, and they can also be utilized with uh, wedge anchors. All right, we just talked about everything here. Like I said, trademark, ready to load, and the torque value. And your wedge anchors, which are right here, just big concrete bolts. Tap them through, set them in, uh, run your nut up, your nut up, and just do your best when you're setting them with a mallet or a hammer. Uh, hit the striking head. Don't hit the, the threads because then your bolt won't go down or you won't be able to get it off and you're going to lose your hoist ring. Once you set these with wedge anchors, you're going to lose the wedge anchor. The, the, the benefit is you just take the nut and you can remove the, uh, the hoist ring and use it again because they're, they're not, they are pretty expensive. Just understand they come in a lot of pieces. You're going to have a, two different washers, your swivel connection in the ring itself. And if you're not paying attention and you lose one of the pieces, it's not, very, it's not really going to work very well for you. All right. Also, make sure that the bolt that you're using it with meets or exceeds the rating of the, the anchor. Because like I said before, you're only as strong as your weakest link. doesn't matter if you have a 10,000 pound hoist ring if the wedge anchor is only rated at 5,000 pounds. All right. When you're setting your wedge anchors, this is something you may uh, get into if you start getting into your lifting moving components or you start going through structural collapse school. But a good rule of thumb if you have to set um, uh, wedge anchors with hoist rings and like a slab of concrete, everything's typically based on the diameter of the bolt. All right. All right. So when I'm coming from the edge of the concrete, all right, I want to be um, nine times the bolt diameter. Um, for anchor depth, I don't be six times the bolt diameter from the, the concrete edge minimum. And then if I'm going to space bolt uh, hoist rings between each other, I want to make sure that those bolts at least are 12 times the diameter of the bolt apart. So if I start getting getting too cl close, you're going to weaken the concrete. And that concrete's going to spall, and they could prematurely uh, allow your your connection points to fail. So we want to have those spaced out. All right, snap blocks. Basically, all they are just big, hefty, heavy-duty pulleys that are utilized in the uh, the, the, uh, the lifting world. All right, very, very beneficial. You can get some that have shackle connections built into them, as well as your 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 sling hooks, your latching sling hooks, and you can also get double uh, snatch blocks out there, but they are very, very heavy. All right, so. Uh, they must be compatible with the diameter of the rope. Like we talked about earlier, the, the D, DD ratio for your wire rope is not going to be the same as your wire rope sling. So go based off the manufacturer of who you're, of who you're buying your, your winch line through. I would say the, the average is typically somewhere between uh, 12 and a 15 to 1 DD ratio for your winch cable. For wire rope winches, if you start getting into synth synthetic lines, which we'll talk about in a minute, that's a, uh, a little bit different. All right. And you can, you may find some that are heavy duty steel. You're seeing a lot now where the, the outer plates are aluminum and a lot of them have a, a composite sheath, which is nice because they're very, very strong and they're, and they're lightweight. So there are some different things out there. Um, just be mindful. The one thing I didn't talk about here, if you have, if you run with either steel wire rope or you run with synthetic rope and you're utilizing snatch blocks, have designated blocks for each winch cable because those what that wire rope can over time start to kind of groove and burr the sheath of your pulley and then if you use that same pulley with your synthetic line it's going to snag and damage your synthetic cable 
So if you're running with two different cables, have blocks designated for both kinds. Or if you go from a wire rope and you replace it and you end up going with synthetic, do a good inspection of your blocks or do your best to possibly maybe even replace your blocks with the new cable just so you have stuff designated for one or the other just to prolong the, uh, the life of your equipment and help prevent anything from failing when you load it. All right. Um, identification tags, your block will have a tag on it and it should be like a sticker or a tag uh, riveted to it. And same thing, it's gonna tell you who made it, the sheaf side, the work load limit. And they're typically, a lot of the good ones will give you like even different safety factors based on what it's rated at, at a four to one or a five to one. But same thing, if that tag comes off or you can't read it anymore, I really wouldn't be using it. And same thing, keep them uh, lubricated and make sure they're not getting real oxidized and rusted up because if those things start binding and aren't working properly, that friction is going to add into what you're pulling and it's you're not gonna get the same benefits out of it either as a change of direction or as a mechanical advantage. All right, so heavy rigging hardware. All If it meets any of these things, we just wanna go through and inspect it and take a look at it. And if we see any, if there's anything that's been cracked or burred or has real excessive wear points, if it's been exposed to any kind of really corrosive uh, chemicals or something on hazmat, uh, uh, materials on maybe a potential like heavy vehicle incident, if anything's bent, stretched, elongated, deformed in any way, if it's got severe pitting or rust and it's not operating properly, um, if it's not stamped and the tag's not legible, and if anything's like if the hook on it is not is deformed or inoperable, we're gonna pull it out of if it, we're gonna pull it out of uh, out of out of service. All right. Your manual lever hoist. So now we're going to get into a lot of your different types of hoists that we carry on the rigs. All right. So you're going to have your chain falls, your chain hoist. Chain falls are a little different. They kind of make a loop and you'll see them more in an industrial setting, like for like an overhead uh, pull point, they'll just have it there and they can pull from the ground to hoist something up. Your chain hoist is a, uh, is a one section chain and as you pull the slack down one side, you can lock it in place and now lift the object up. We see we, we utilize chain hoists more than we use chain falls. Your come alongs, which are typically maybe synthetic or wire rope. And then your grip pullers or your wire rope pullers, which is the generic name. And like the big manufacturer is Tractel. They make they make the, the brand name uh, grip hoist, which a lot of people will refer them to. But the generic name is wire rope puller. And there's a lot of there's a couple different manufacturers that make variations of those. All right, so any manual hoist that's used to pull as a pulling tool, it can be used for pulling, winching, may or may not be rated for overhead lifting. If it is rated for overhead lifting, it's going to meet that minimum of a four to one safety factor, and there's going to be things designed into it that give it the ability to be used for overhead lifting. Not all manual lever hoists, not all your come alongs are designed or intended for overhead lifting, so just be mindful of that when you're utilizing equipment. All right. All right. If it is rated for overhead lifting, it should be inspected and logged annually, just like everything else. Um, it, the, the chain in your chain hoist, it does not meet the same requirements as the as wire rope or the, the chain sling. So like if you have a wire cable puller or you have a chain hoist, the chain isn't inspected and logged in, uh, individually. That is basically rated and is designed as a overall system. So it's not gonna meet the same parameters, all right? If the uh, if it is rated for overhead lifting, like we said before, it's going to equal a four to one safety factor or higher. And typically, the mechani mechanical advantage of the tool is based on 100 pounds of input force. And what we mean by that is when that handle is on and fully extended, the person operating it can, could input about 100 pounds of input force into the machine over and over and over again. So if that guy or that person, I should say, operating that machine can't get that handle to move and that's a good indicator that you're getting close to overloading it and meeting the maximum capacity of it we're not going to put multiple people on the handle we're not going to try to use pipes and extend the lever because you're just asking to get hurt mechanical advantage of the uh of the tool you can use uh snatch blocks and things to increase the rating with like your wire rope pullers and a lot of times your come alongs will have a built-in two to one pulley built into them to give you built-in ma and things like that so just be mindful of those, all right? The tapered handles or the shear pins are what we're talking about uh, that are designed to allow that handle to fail before you overload it and destroy the machine. So here's a come along and that handle was tapered on the on the end and when it was over, overloaded, the handle bent and came back on itself before the machine blew apart and 
hurt somebody. So now all I have to do is they can literally pull the nuts, take that handle off and put a new hand, uh, purchase a new handle and bolt it back on and the come along is still usable. It hasn't, the machine itself hasn't been damaged. All right. It, make, it is a good practice though. If this does happen, just take a double uh, check on the, on the device and go through and take a look at it and make sure nothing has been damaged on it. But like I said, the handles are designed to fail well before the machine does. All right. Your, your wire rope pullers will have shear pins. All right. These pins are designed, like we said, just like the handle, the, the pins will break and the handle will come off before the machine is overloaded. And most of the manufacturers of your wire rope pullers will give you spare pins. And they're typically in one of the handles, whether it be the carrying handle that's built into it or one of the hall handles. You, there's a rubber grommet. You pull that out and you'll probably have a, spare, a couple spare pins in there. You just tap a tap a pin back in and then you're back in business and you can utilize this machine. Like I said, just make sure you take a quick look at it. Make sure nothing has been stretched or or bent, but like I said, typically these pins are going to go way before the machine does. All right. Getting in your wire roll pullers, this is a, uh, a big thing that I, I know a lot of people want to do. When you're utilizing these things, you don't, you want, and you're maintaining them, do not use white lithium grease. People want to jam them up with grease inside to keep the, uh, the mechanisms inside lubricated. What that grease will do, it will take a lot of the dirt and the dust and grime that gets in there and it binds up and it will start basically, um, it will start screwing up your, your cable as it runs through the machine and it could cause the cable to kink or birdcage inside the machine. And if that happens, you're, you're not getting the cable out of it without disassembling the machine and cutting the cable, which is not easy because it's very, very strong plow steel cable. And these machines are typically, they're not, they're not very cheap. They are quite expensive. So, and they're very, very uh, helpful in incidents. One of my favorite machines. So do your best to take care of them. All the manufacturer is going to want you to use is just put some, motor oil down in there and just exercise that and keep the the inner workings lubricated, but try to avoid uh, putting any kind of grease type product in there. This is what can happen to your cable when utilizing grease. You can see how the cable completely unraveled and jammed up inside the device and they were not able to get it out. They had to take the whole thing apart and try to cut the cable out just to, in order to purchase a new cable to continue to use the machine. All right. Same thing, like all of everything else, we're gonna go through and we're gonna look for any of these components when we're inspecting it and logging it and uh, make sure we're uh, either getting it repaired or removed from service if it meets any of these things. Like I said, cracks or burrs, excessive wear, anything uh, that looks like it's been exposed to bad chemicals, if anything's bent or deformed or just not operating in the proper way, um, oxidized or corroded. Um, if it just doesn't look right and it's not operating the way that it's intended, if it's if the ratings not uh, been worn off and you don't even know what it's rated to pull or any of the infor identification information is not on there anymore, um, the hooks themselves that are, are the same thing are inoperable. And remember, ASME has that whole standard specific to hooks. And if your shear pins or your handles have looked like they've been partially blown or partially bent, just remove it from service and uh, anything outside the manufacturer's recommendations. All right. Getting into our winches, all right? Um, what we see in the fire services um, are typically two styles. You'll have your electric winches, which may be fixed or pinnable. Um, a lot of units I know run with like uh, um, hitch receivers mounted in different spots in their apparatus, and they can basically have a pinnable winch where they will pin into place. And you could have your winch specced with a synthetic wire, uh, rope or wire rope, depending on what you feel is best and what application works for you and your personnel and your your first to your uh, response area. All right. Um, also, you may see your, a lot of your bigger, heftier winches are maybe hydraulically driven and run off of a, a generator of some type. I would say typically your electric wing, range winch is going to be somewhere between eight and 12,000 pounds. And once you get into your big 20 and 30,000 pound winches, they're typically going to be a bigger diameter cable and they're going to be hydraulically driven um, and fixed. They're usually coming off the back or coming off the front or something like that. Um, and you can also can have your, your fixed electric winches. Just note if you are, uh, if you do have a pinnable winch, not, uh, typically they will run off of a two inch receiver and the minimum for a two inch receiver is 6,000 pounds. And I know a lot of manufacturers will give you a bigger, beefier two inch receiver that may be rated at 10 or 12,000 pounds but it's not standard, you need to request that and they're probably gonna charge you extra extra for that. So don't assume all 
toe receivers and pin points are rated the same. And it doesn't do any good to have a 10,000 pound pinnable winch if your receiver is only rated at 6,000 pounds. Because like I said, you're only as strong as your weakest link. So that's going to be your weakest point. So be mindful of that. All right. Uh, your winches typically are not designed for overhead lifting. Like I said, you get in a lot of your big heavy duty winches, like your ones that are uh, on rotators and cranes are hydraulically driven and they're going to be made up typically out of a different cable and they're going to have that that design factor built into them. Not all of your, you know, your, your pinnable electric four wheel, uh, four by four designed winches are going to have overhead capabilities. So be mindful of that. Your rate of capacity is between four wraps and one layer of wraps. This is a big thing that a lot of people don't realize. If you have a 12,000 pound winch or a 10,000 pound winch, you can't pull that 10 or 12,000 pounds. The second that that hook comes off the drum, like you can't pull that in any capacity in, in, in any, in any place. So as your drum kind of comes in and that cable comes off, when you pull your cable all the way out, you want to leave somewhere a minimum of four wraps on that drum for friction to bite into. Cause if you pull it off, you're just going to pull off the connection point or the slug and you'll pull the cable right out of the drum. So you want to leave at least four wraps around that drum. So between four wraps and one full layer of wrap, that's what we call your pull zone. That's where your rated capacity is, is at. As you start coiling that drum and those wraps start to increase, you go one, two, three, four, five layers of wraps. The, the more wraps you have, the bigger that drum gets, the less mechanical advantage that's built into that winch, the lower your capacity is going to be. So like a, um, a 12,000 pound winch. So if you have a hundred foot spool on there, you might have five layers of wraps will that 12,000 pound winch with five layers of wraps may only be rated at 6,400 pounds. So by getting cable off of the drum and not being right on top of the, uh, the object you're trying to winch or pull might be better because it's going to get more, more cable off your drum and get you closer to that max pull zone. So just be aware of that. All right. And when you're, uh, the rope, the, whether it's synthetic or wire rope, make sure we're, we're, we're spooling that nice and tight and in line and on top of itself properly. If it starts going all over the place and cinching back in itself and getting flat spots, it's just not going to play out properly and it's going to be weak and prematurely fell on you or jam up and you're just not going to be able to use it. Right. So you can go through all your winch manufacturers and they should tell you the rate, the ratings of their winch based on those certain configurations. So this is just an example, like I talked about your 12,000 pound winch with four layers is 6,500 and they, and then at one layer you're at 12,000. And then, you, like I said, as you go up two layers, 92, three layers, eight, and then like I said, come down to four and you're at 65 and your 10,000 pound winch is on the same. So go through your manufacturer and go through their, uh, the, the manual and their literature and they should give you all that. All right. And hopefully your winch looks like the one on the left. And if it looks like the one on the right, I would try to get it, probably replace that cable and then get it straightened out. All right. Synthetic Dyneema rope, which is uh, a lot of the, the big new thing on the scene that even a lot of the tow companies and a lot of the big rotators are going to synthetic line. There are a lot of advantages to it. Um, you ha I have some here. If you look at this, the big benefit to it is it bends back on itself. So that DD ratio is virtually nothing. It's very pliable. When it does get flat spots or bird cages, you can kind of just work it back into itself. Um, it's very light. It floats on water. It has very minimal um, stored energy in it. So if it does fail, it kind of just drops. It's not going to slingshot back on you. And it's real easy to inspect on your fingers when you're going through there because it, you don't, you're not worried about broken wires or anything like that. It does, nothing's free. It does have its downside. And um, wire rope is going to be much more um, resistant to abrasion and sharp edges, which in, you know, the fire service and on vehicle extrications and things like that, we have a lot of. So, like I said, whatever you feel like is the best benefit for your response area and your personnel, but both both have their advantages and disadvantages. All right. I think we just talked about a lot of the, the pros and cons to synthetic Dyneema rope, like I said, it is very, very strong and it is very, very pliable, and which is nice. But if you run it over a sharp edge, it's not going to last very long where your wire rope, like I said, you can run it over some sharp edges. It's still not designed that way, but it's going to be more durable to and, and hold up to those better. 
but it also wants to kink and get flat spots and cinch into itself a lot easier. And then that will also damage it and potentially take it out of service. So at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter which one you run with that they need to be used properly and maintained and take care of and stowed properly, or it's going to give you problems. All right. So pulleys. So getting into heavy rigging, if we start using pulleys or snatch blocks into uh, in unison with our winches, there's a lot that go into pulleys that we need to understand, all right? Pulleys are force multipliers and they have a force multiplier of two. So that pulley is always going to compound force no matter where it's put. If it's applied to the load and it's traveling with the load, that force multiplier is going to be applied to the load and it's going to give you mechanical advantage. If that pulley is fixed on an anchor attachment, it still has a force multiplier of two, except for now it's doubling or compounding forces and that force multiplier is going to be applied to the anchor and everything on the anchor that's holding it. So if you trace your numbers through, just understand if your pulleys are traveling or fixed, you can determine what type of load you're going to put on that to make sure your equipment is substantial enough to hold what you're asking it to hold. All right, if the, if the pulley is fixed on an anchor, and is being used as a change of direction, then that pulley will increase the force applied to that anchor, all right? If the pulley is traveling with the load, then the force is being applied to the load and is creating mechanical advantage, just like we talked about, all right? Nothing is free, like I said before. Mechanical advantage makes your work easier and you will get more out of your equipment, but it is also less efficient. It will slow the system down and it's going to take longer. So for a perfect example is, if I run my rope through one traveling pulley and I create a two to one mechanical advantage, that rope now has to pull a foot in each direction get, to get the load to move one foot. So I'm using two foot of cable. The, the cable has to travel two feet to get the load to move one foot. So not pulling as much, but the system's slower. There's always a, a trade off or a cost. All right. And you also must account for the friction as well as the load. And we'll talk about that in a little, little bit when you start, especially when you start winching or dragging things, or so, you always have to account for uh, friction. And friction could be quite a bit. All right. The service contact that the rope um, has with the pulley will determine the force being applied to the pulley. So if I run a rope through a change of direction and that rope comes back at zero degrees back the other way, it has maximum surface contact with the pulley. All right. So my hand, my, here's the pulley up here and it's coming back at zero degrees. It's got maximum surface contact with this pulley. So this pulley and everything here is going to see 200%. As this rope does this and that angle changes, that surface contact with the pulley will decrease. So the load on that anchor will decrease. The same thing goes with mechanical advantage. If this pulley is now hooked to my load well, at zero degrees, I have maximum mechanical advantage. If I start pulling off on an angle, I start decreasing service contact with that pulley, I'm gonna start losing mechanical advantage because my pulley's not as efficient because it doesn't have as much surface contact. So just understand that. All right, so change of directions like we were talking about. Zero to 20 degrees, that anchor and that chain and everything there is holding 200%. So if I'm pulling a 5,000 pound load, that snatch block, that chain and that anchor are holding 10,000 pounds. Start moving to the pitcher in the middle. Well, that angle starts opening up. The surface contact on that pulley is going to decrease. So at 90 degrees, the actual number is 141%. But like I said before, I like to make things real easy. Just think everybody can remember 150. So at 90 degrees, you're seeing 150% on that block, anchor, and chain. And then as that angle opens up, like we did before with our sling angles, that magic number, 120 degrees, everything's equal. If I'm pulling 5,000 pounds, then the load weighs 5,000 pounds, the winch is pulling 5,000 pounds, the snatch block and the chain and the anchor there are seeing 5,000 pounds. And as that angle closes, it's going to increase or decrease based on the uh, surface contact you're putting with the object. And like we said before, same thing with your mechanical advantage. If this was an object you were going to pull, you get maximum mechanical advantage with the pitcher on the left. As you start pulling out on more of an angle, that service contact with that pulley is going to decrease. Your mechanical advantage is going to decrease. It's not going to be as efficient. You're going to have to pull more weight to get it to move. All right. Using a grip hoist, you can in snatch blocks, you can create mechanical advantage. So being able to trace those numbers through, like we talked about. So first picture is a straight one to one. That grip hoist can pull eight thousand pounds, and that one to one configuration, it can pull eight thousand pounds because that's what it's rated to pull. 
you come to the next picture, the grip weight says 8,000 pounds on it, but we put it through a snatch block, which is attached to the load. So it's traveling in the system. It's giving me mechanical advantage. That pulley has that force factor of two we were talking about. So now that 8,000 pounds turns into 16,000 pounds at the load, and it's going to come back to 8,000 pounds. So the grip poise has 8,000 pounds. That red shackle and green sling and that uh, cable on that side are each holding eight, but together they are pulling 16. What you're doing is you're using your anchor as your buddy, and your anchor's holding a lot of the load, so the grip poise isn't working as hard. All right. You go to the pitch, the next picture, the three to one. You can do the same thing, and we can do this any time by tracing our numbers through to, to see what we're asking out of them. That grip hoist, now 8,000 pounds, comes up to that snatch block. We already said it gives us 16. It comes back to 8. Well, now it comes to a change of direction pulley here, so that force factor of 2 again. So it goes up to 16 again, but now that green sling, the anchor, and that snatch block at the anchor are holding 16,000 pounds, so it's compounding force on my anchor. It comes back to eight, eight goes up, and eight is pulling side by side with 16, giving me 24,000 pounds of potential mechanical advantage. And if you take an 8,000 pound grip hoist into a three to one, eight times three gives you 24. So that's how our, our MA works. Same thing with the, the four to one. 8,000 pounds in, 16 back to eight. That change of direction in the middle is gonna hold 16. It's gonna go back to eight. So each block has the ability to pull 16,000 pounds and so now the four to one with the 8,000 pound grip hoist theoretically could be 32,000 pounds. And the two outside legs are holding eight and the, the leg in the middle with the pulley is holding 16 because pulleys are force multipliers. So if you know how to trace your numbers through, you can kind of make sure the equipment you're asking that to hold is holding what it should. So let's just look at that four to one picture. Well, if that purple strap on the end, I'm asking it to hold 8,000 pounds and the green strap I'm old, asking to hold 16. So if I had a 10,000 pound strap and a 20,000 pound strap, I could put those in the right place to maximize my equipment. But if I don't understand the numbers I'm putting and mixed them up, now one strap would be overloaded where the other one would be substantially stronger than what I was asking it to hold. So just understanding how to trace your numbers through, you can put your equipment in the right place and maximize it to make sure you're not overloading your system. And like I said, you always want to know where your weakest link is, what's your foul point if the system is let go. Um, the one thing we have not talked about um, getting into all of this is you need to have, anytime we start lifting or moving anything, we start talking about sling angles and sling tensions and mechanical advantage. We obviously need to know what our load weighs. And the one thing I was hemming and hawing about was getting into the load calculation stuff with this, but we could spend two or three hours just talking about that versus what different material weighs and how to do our math and, you know, our coefficients and all that stuff. So maybe we do that another day, but just understand in order to utilize mechanical advantage and to apply all these theories and concepts we're talking about, you need to know what your object weighs. And I know Jeff did one on a heavy uh, a webinar on heavy vehicles and he went into calculating loads with heavy vehicles. So that can apply if that's what you're messing with. Um, but just understand before we do anything, we need to know what our object weighs and that's going to be our constant. And that's what all of our math is going to be based on. All right. All right. So wheel damage, we started talking about friction and um, before and we talked about how we need to account for that. So we're, we're, we're talking winching now. So now we're going to be dragging things out of in place and just understand what we can actually be applying to our equipment without understanding what we're doing. So anytime we have like some kind of an override or an underride or a rollover where we need to lift the, the bigger object and remove the vehicle from underneath it to get clearance for extrication, we're going to be dragging that vehicle. We need to account for a couple of things. All right. So if that car was in neutral, um, and the tires were rolling freely and we started pushing, we're only dealing with about 10% of the total vehicle weight and that whole, an object in motion tends to stay in motion. Think about if your car ever ran out of gas and you had to push it, um, it's hardest to get it moving right in the beginning. Once it's rolling, it wants to stay rolling, but every time it stops, you have to put that little extra in, in, into it to get it moving, which is, you know, inertia essentially. So that static equilibrium we have to overcome to get it moving and then it wants to stay moving. So the problem is when we have any kind of any kind of a rollover or underride or override like we talked about, 
we're typically, we, we want to maximize our lift. So we're gonna capture the suspension on the vehicle. And we typically wanna capture the front and the back suspension to take, to maximize, keep that car as low as possible, which means the less we have to lift to get daylight, the faster we get the car out, the faster the people are in the car and they're being transported, which is ideal for everybody. Well, if those tires aren't rolling, well, that's gonna start compounding the friction quite a bit. And we need to understand how much that will compound the friction. So basically um, from the tow world, they have a bunch of, of, of numbers and configurations based on things. So for damaged wheels, if the tire is not rolling or it's been uh, bent in or a tie rod or something like go, for every two wheels that don't roll, it's 30% of the total vehicle weight. And for four wheels not that are damaged, it's 66% of the vehicle weight. Like I said, I'm real, e uh, I'm real big on keeping things easy. The easiest way to remember that, and I've actually played with this on, with load scales and things like that. When I take ratchet straps and cinch both my suspensions and completely pull those tires into the wheel well, it will actually uh, compound those numbers a little bit more. And what I found is it could be as much as 100%. So if you basically say 25% of the vehicle weight for every locked tire that is captured, that's how much load you're going to be pulling. So if we capture both the front and the back suspension, well, that's 100% of the total vehicle weight due to the friction because now those tires aren't rolling, we're dragging them. And that's just for the friction that the tires has have with the ground. And that's on a level, smooth surface like concrete or asphalt. If you start pulling in like deep gravel or mud or water, something's got a lot of suction, that 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 friction coefficient can can multiply. So we're, we already know we're at 100. If I if we have all four tires locked up, we're pulling close to 100% of the vehicle weight. And then I can get in my surf, surface coefficients. Well, then I'm going to add another 10% if it's on if it's on grass, and another 20% if it's on deep gravel. You get into sad mud or water, and it, it can compound exponentially. So it is very plausible to have a 3,000 or 3,500 pound vehicle in the in the in the position you have it in, in the, the circumstance you have to pull it out of. You could easily be pulling four, 45, 5,000 pounds based on the situation of the. That the, that the vehicle's in. So just be mindful of that. The other thing we need to account for is gravity as well with gradient coefficients. If 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 it's on any, if we have to pull on any kind of an uphill grade, well, gravity is wanting to push the car down. So now we have to overcome gravity. And basically here's a chart based on your angle. So anywhere from 15 degrees, you could be another 25% of the vehicle weight. 30 degrees, it's almost 50%. So depend on the situation you're in, all these things need to be, to be accounted for. If you're utilizing a winch, I am a big fan of, I try to put my winches in mechanical advantage, at least two to ones as much as I can for a bunch of reasons. So um, let's talk about those. We already talked about where my winch is strongest. I wanna get as close to that pull capacity as I can, that max, that, that max pull zone, all right? So the more cable I get off my drum, the closer I'm gonna get to that pull zone. Well, if I run it through a two to one, I've just doubled the length of my cable. So that's more winch line I'm getting off my drum, getting me close to that, that, that max pull capacity. It's also creating mechanical advantage. So it's giving me a two to one mechanical advantage, which is increasing my pulling capacity because of the MA as well. And like we said before, nothing's free. It's slowing my system down. But understand when you're using an electric winch, it's an electric motor that kind of you tap that button and it's an electric motor that spins that drum. Well, it's kind of jerky. And if I'm pulling a car out from underneath a, a, a vehicle, I don't necessarily want it to be real fast and real jerky. So by running it through that two to one mechanical advantage, it's going to slow the system down and give me more control. So I'm a big fan of doing that for those three reasons. Slower, more control, more capacity and gets my winch in a more ideal situation to where it wants to be to maximize it. All right. Another option that is out there, um, I know there are some uh, fire departments and some rescue companies and things like that throughout the country that will carry these. These are called toe skates and they're very relatively inexpensive. They don't take up much room and essentially all they are is just composite, smooth composite wedges. And if you look at those little uh, connection points on the end, you can take multiple ones and lock them together to make them narrower or wider. But all you do is um, basically you can take a mallet and kind of drive them under the tire. And it's basically just like a roller skate. It will cut your friction down uh, exponentially now you're not pulling nearly the load you were when you're you're dragging that car out because you've just decreased the friction so much. So they're a nice uh, little tool to carry and then kind of help help a lot of those things out for uh, for winch outs. All right. 
going to get into our tie down and uh, our toe and our tie down equipment. So we went th through a lot of our overhead uh, lifting equipment quite a bit. Um, now I want to go into a little bit of our tie down stuff and talk about some uh, how that stuff's kind of designed and what it's intended for. And because we see a lot of people using a lot of this stuff and not necessarily using it in the right ways and just understand that it also has some uh, parameters behind it. So when our toe down, our, our toe and our tie down equipment. So like I said, a lot of our winches are technically going to be toe equipment because they're not designed and not, not intended for overhead lifting, which we kind of got into those, but uh, all of our grade 70 chain, which we've hit on a little bit. Um, Dyneema synthetic lashing chain, like we talked about that, that, that Dyneema chain, it could be, they do make some for transport as well as overhead lifting. Toe straps, axle, axle straps, all your toe clusters, your chain binders, and your, 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 your eyelets and your ratchet straps, which we use every fire department throughout the country uses quite a bit. So thing with tie down equipment, it's not mandated to be logged. I would highly recommend it does make a best practice. And if you're going to go through and keep a log on all your gear as a best practice, why not inspect your winches and your chain binders and your grade 70 chain and your ratchet straps to make sure they're operating properly and there's nothing behind them because we utilize them so much. It's definitely a best practice, but it is not mandated. They are also not mandated, like your, your grade 70 chain is not mandated to be tagged like overhead chain, but it is mandated to be at least stamped with a legible rating. All these things need to have some kind of rating on them and it needs to be legible. And if you don't know what the rating is on them, I wouldn't be using them. All right. A lot of your grade 70 chain, the manufacturer puts a tag on it anyways. Just understand it doesn't have to be there as long as you it has that stamp on it and you know what it what it's rated for and you can read it. All right. So ratchet straps, typically the ones you're going to see the most are your uh, your two inch wide webbing um, come in a variety of lengths, anywhere from 10 to 30 feet. And you can get a number of different types of connections, like your, your snap link connections, your J hooks, which are probably the most common. And then you can also get them with a grade 70 chain connection, which have a, can be very helpful in certain circumstances. All of your ratchet straps, all your metal, metal components for all your tow equipment are typically grade 70. And like we said, all that stuff's made at a three to one safety factor. All right. And like I said, they don't have to have on all your ratchet straps should have an ID tag on them. It needs to be legible and it's typically going to tell you like how long they are, what they're made out of, a working load limit and a breaking strength. All right. And so like we said before, take your working load limit, divide it by your breaking strength, and that's going to give you a safety factor. And typically you're going to see a three to one. All right. Grade 70 chain. We've hit on this quite a bit. Carbon steel versus alloy does not have those elongation properties. Three to one versus four to one safety factor and lower rating, which is why it's not used for overhead lifting. Understand, uh, I don't know if I did a good job talking about this in the beginning. Um, a true overhead lift is when we're taking that whole load and we're lifting it like they do in a crane world where you could potentially have to be working under an unsupported load. What we typically do is we're doing some form of cantilevered lift where we're lifting a portion of the load because it's stabilized on the other side. The other thing we're doing as we lift is we're capturing. We're typically chasing with struts or capturing with cribbing as we go. Overhead lifting in the crane world, the reason they have such high parameters is because they don't have the ability to capture from underneath. This load needs to come up. They're taking hundred percent of the load and they're moving it to a different place. And those guys, a lot of time are in a situation where they need to operate under, underneath that load. That's why there's such high parameters on this equipment. Same thing in the, the recovery world for those overhead recoveries. Um, we don't do it a ton in the fire service, but we do have the potential to do it. If we're working with cranes or rotators on scene or in that USAR structural collapse environment where we're utilizing cranes and rubble piles to move objects out of the way and recover victims. So just understand the differences there. All right. A lot of this already. Um, not trying to beat a dead horse. So we talked about that chrom gold chromate finish as well. It's not always on there. So if you see a chain and you're like, it's not gold, and it's obviously grade 80. Not necessarily. If you there are grade grade 70 carbon steel chain out there that does not that do not have that finish, and it looks a lot like grade 80. So always look at the tag or the stamp or the stamp on the link to determine what you're using. All right. Like I said um, it may be stamped. It may be tagged. Like BA products here, they do a lot. They put a, even though it's grade 70 on their other chain and their cluster, they'll uh, they'll stamp it as well, all right? And it says right there, their safety factor is three to one. Some manufacturers will make it to a higher safety factor, but it's not mandated. A lot of your tow accessories, like your, your clusters, you can get these things made however you want. And there's a lot of different versions out there based on what you feel you need the most and how you run. 
some of your hooks will have locks on them. You can get chain shorteners, your different types of close hook clusters, your J hooks, your J hook extensions. You can get even get grade 70 chain with a snatch block connected onto it. All right. Chain binders. Um, we utilize these a lot with our chain when we're marrying objects together, potentially capturing suspension, especially with heavy vehicles. But we're going to utilize them the most is when uh, we start like binding our, our rescue, our lifting struts together, which we're going to talk about in a minute. Uh, the one on the left there, your lever, your lever style, style chain binder. I am not a big fan of it. If they are overloaded, that lever can let go. And if you're fighting to kind of get it to lock in place, it could come back and basically snap you in the hand, snap you in the mouth. And it's, they're not my favorite. I would recommend not using them. I'm going to stay with the ratchet style because all it is is a, a ratchet that operates at a high mechanical advantage and you just crank it nice and tight. And then you can release the lever and let out. So much, much safer for what we do and where we're going to be operating. Right. Um, they should be stamped with a working load limit and the hook size. There are binders out there that will say three eighths slash half inch. You can use them for both size chain. They're designed that way. Um, they're designed for securing loads. We're not going to use them in an overhead lifting sling and tension a chain to lift up in the air with it. They're not rated that way. They're, they're typically grade 70 and they are made at a three to one safety factor and typically made out of carbon steel. There are grade 100 binders out there because based on the transport world, certain pieces of heavy equipment where they need to secure them to flat beds and oversized trucks, they need the grade 100 material because of the rating, not because it's designed to be lifted overhead. So even those grade 100 binders are typically only made to a three to one safety factor intentionally by the manufacturer. So they're not used in overhead lifting. So if you have a binder and it's grade 100, don't think it's okay to lift things in the air with it because it's, it's not designed that way. All right. Um, most of them will be designed with, with grab hooks and you can buy cradled and non cradled, uh, grab hooks on the end of your binders. So when we're using them with our rescue struts, like we'll see here in the picture in a couple minutes, if you have the ability to get the cradled hooks, you're going to maintain full capacity of your chain, um, through the system. The one thing that, uh, a lot of the one question that comes up quite a bit is, well, if my grade binder is rated at 12,000 pounds, and even without the cradled hooks and my, my chains 8,800, well, if the binder is so much stronger than the chain, if I take that 20% reduction, I'm still good. It doesn't work that way. Remember the, that 20% deduction is coming from the chain. The binder could be rated at 50,000 pounds. It, that the binder is not what you're weakening. It's weakening the chain. So as long as that binder has those non-cradled hooks, you're losing that 20% off your chain. All right, because due to the surface contact and the side load you're putting on the link of the chain, and that's going to be your fail point. All right, just going over your different style binders and the, the ratcheting kind. Basically, it's real easy. Flip the lever, it's going to pull both ends in or it's going to let both ends out. So it's either tension or slack. All right, one technique with these though, if you're trying to get your slack out of it, get it as tight as you can by hand because you only have so much thread on those binders. And before you get it loaded, you can actually grab the handle and just spin the side and it will work a lot faster. So you'll, you'll get it tighter a lot quicker. And then once you've got a load on it, then you just go to your handle to tension it nice and tight. Just time purposes, it works out a little better. Getting into our uh, stabilization and our lifting struts. And this is gonna be the last thing we go over today. So we start moving into really heavy loads, like our, our heavy, heavy vehicles for lifting and stuff like that. Um, in my opinion, ratchet straps kind of go out the window at this point. You've got to understand ratchet straps um, can be very, very strong, but they are nylon and they're going to stretch and they're and the rating on them is not going to be substantial enough to hold what we're asking it to hold um, with lifting struts and angles like we talked about already are going to play into that, which we'll get into a minute in a minute. So once we start moving into our heavy vehicles and our heavy, heavy loads, we're going to start transitioning into chain and binders. And there's some ways we can hook these up to our struts to maximize them and some bad things we can do without even realizing it. All right. So first off, we need to talk our angles with our struts. And this is a Paratech chart. I don't know what you run with. If you do run with Paratech, uh, they're a great tool. In my opinion, they kind of sell themselves. But um, the rating on your struts is going to be in a straight compressed column load. As that angle starts going out, you're going to be starting to put more of a side load on your strut and the capacity of that strut is going to diminish because of the angle that you're putting on it. And there's a load indicator here. Um, that you can figure out. So basically you can see at 75%, you basically, you have your axial load and you basically multiply that by like 1.4 and it will tell you what, 
what you can actually hold. And as the angle gets greater, the multiplier gets bigger because the more force that's coming down on it, the less you're going to be able to lift. And the steeper you get, the worst. All right. So at 30 degrees, it's double. All right. So your capacity essentially would be half. Also, if we have two struts like this, we're creating those big triangles for, for uh, strength. Not only the wider my angle gets, the more vertical load that I'm putting on, a, on the side of that strut, so less capacity of the strut, the connection point, whether it's a ratchet strap or chain or whatever you're holding, the wider that angle gets, the more you're asking that device to hold. And there's also a multiplier for that, which is the one on the bottom. So you can see here, like at, at um, your 90 degree vertical, well, that strap would be holding nothing because those struts are a complete compression being driven into the ground. So whatever's hooking them together is really not holding much. But if you go to the 30 degrees, whatever that total load you have at 30 degrees, because your struts are so low, now that chain or that ratchet strap, whatever you're asking it to hold, is now seeing 175, 173% because that's these things want to kick out so much that chain's basically what's holding everything. So we want to do our best not to have that chain in the strongest configuration because that's what's holding the entire system. And if that chain lets go, everything's coming going away. So that's what we're going to kind of go into and talk about here. All right. Talk about ratchet straps. Ratchet straps are great for passenger vehicles. I'm not holding much weight, especially with passenger vehicles on the roof. Typically, what you're going to see is the motor compartment down. The amount of weight you're holding on the back is minimal. All right. And all day long, I'll use ratchet straps. A two inch ratchet strap that's rated at 3,300 pounds with a 10,000 pound braking strength. Great. I'll, I'll do it all day long. Once we get into those heavy vehicles, we're moving to chain and binders. Some people will talk about, well, what if I double up ratchet straps? All right. So we'll talk about that. Double up my ratchet strap. All right. It's definitely better than a single ratchet strap, but it's still nylon. It will stretch. And when that load gets put onto those struts, those straps are going to stretch and they're going to potentially be overloaded. And two ratchet straps at 3,300 pounds is still weaker than one grade 83 eighths inch chain. All right. Plus, like we said, chain's not going to stretch unless you severely overload it. It's going to capture the load and hold it right where you want it to. All right. I've actually been in situations where with not very much weight, um, where we had a load on a ratchet strap and we want to transfer the load from lift struts to the capture struts with a ratchet strap. And when the load sagged, it kept stretching the strap so much we weren't able to get the load off of it. So anything, anything medium grade or heavy when it comes to vehicles, um, I'm using chain and binders as a best practice, All right? So going back into our chain, connection points to your uh, on your struts and how you're hooking your chain to them. So we talked about that whole DD ratio. We talked about chain has a DD ratio of six to one. So at um, if that D handle on that Paratech strut right there is a three eighths inch diameter, and the chain is three eighths inch diameter. That gives me a one to one DD ratio. Chain at a one to one DD ratio is only 50% capacity because you can see that link is being completely side loaded up against that handle when I do that, when I bat, when I hook it back on itself like that. All right. So obviously not ideal because I'm basically just, just by doing that, taking my chain and cutting it in half. All right. So not recommended. Um, the middle picture is better. I'm going to take my grab hook and hook it directly onto that D handle. It's kind of milled that way. And now I can pull that chain completely in line. I'm going to get closer to 100% capacity of my chain. All right, notice that that um, the inside of your hook does have a little bit of a, a curvature because it's designed for a link to go in there where your handle is a little flat. There is a minimal reduction of probably one or 2%, but it is not much. Your best case scenario is if you have chain with sling hooks on the end, you can do your self-locking sling hook over the top. Now you're at full capacity and you have a solid connection that's not going anywhere. So those are your best, definitely your best options. All right. Using your binder. So like I said, if you look at that picture, that is a binder with cradled hooks. So when we hook it together, I'm not losing any capacity of my chain. I am able to cinch my basis nice and tight and um, get full capacity through there because I'm not losing that 20% due to the, the non-cradled hooks. If your binder does not have cradled hooks, um, you're going to lose 20%. So another question we get a lot, well, there's two hooks on there. So am I losing 40% or 50%? Um, it doesn't work that way. Just understand that if I have two hooks on two ends, one of those hooks 
is going to be my fail point. I don't know which one it's going to be, but once one of them fails, the whole system goes away. So I'm only taking that reduction one time. All right. Another, uh, another option to do this, if you don't have chain miners, but you have chain shorteners, you can just take a, a like a one foot chain shortener, hook it into the middle of your chain and kind of shorten your chain. And instead of binding, you just get it as tight as you can. And if you take your bases and just kick them out a little bit, now your chain's kind of loaded, it won't go anywhere. And you basically were able to do the same thing without having to bind it up. Just know if you have grade 80 or 100 or 120 um, shorteners, a chain shortener is a chain sling as far as the, uh, the regulation reads. So that still needs to be inspected and maintained. It's the only difference is instead of being five or 10 or 20 foot chain, it's a one foot chain, but the, the parameters behind it are identical. It's still a sling. And that's all I got for you guys. So um, any questions about anything, feel free to reach out to Paratech or reach out to Blue Collar and you know, our website's on here, our Instagram page and our Facebook page. So thanks very uh, much for listening. Hope this is beneficial and everybody got something out of it. And uh, we'll be around for questions for a little while afterwards. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you for watching this webinar on uh on Riggin and Winchin. Thank you, Josh. Uh, now we're going to take a look at uh, some of the questions that, that was asked during the presentation and see if we can uh, actually get through them a little better than trying to type on a little screen. Okay. Uh, you can still ask questions during the, this part on the live chat. So we're going to start with this. Okay, Josh, Shara Cobb asked the question, do extrication chains have to be inspected as rope does. Okay, um, there's nothing really, um, depending on what you want to call them, but there's nothing marketed as an extrication chain. You're gonna have chains that are intended for your alloy steel chains, which are designed for overhead lifting, and your carbon steel chains, which are designed for uh, load securing and basically basic tow and transport chain. If you're using chain, that alloy steel chain with the minimum four to one safety factor, and you have the potential to be doing overhead lifting with them, then yes, per OSHA and ASME, they need to be inspected and logged annually, just like very similar to your to your uh, NFPA requirements for your rope rescue, except for rope is quarterly, your chain is annual, but it should be inspected after every use periodically, and then have a thorough annual inspection that is logged, and those records should be maintained for at least a year till they're replaced with the new records. Thanks, Josh. Uh, Steve Ingram asked a question, why differentiate between horizontal loads and overhead and lifting loads. Would the, would the direction of the force be relative to the chain, not to the most important factor, regardless of whether horizontal or vertical? Okay, so the way you're putting the load on the chain, uh, to answer this question, yes. So if you put a scale in there, the scale doesn't know the difference between weight hanging off of it or force or, or tension being applied to it. It's gonna read the same way and fail it the same way. Um, the reason the, the vertical angle is so important because if we're lifting vertical, now that load is up in the air and we have the potential to be working underneath it, which is why there's such high mandates for that and why that's so important. Pulling horizontally, I'm not going to say it's not dangerous. If you pull so much tension that the chain fell, it's going to come moving back on you and could potentially be a hazard, but the load itself is sitting on the ground. We're not worried about the load coming, falling to the ground or us being underneath it. So. That's the big difference between vertical and horizontal, why we put such an emphasis on vertical lifting. Okay. John Murphy asked this question. If the manufacturer gives a seven to one safety factor, can that be used at a five to one or a four to one per OSHA guidelines? Um, I would always say never exceed your working load limit that the manufacturer stamps on the equipment unless it is specified by the manufacturer that it's acceptable to do that. And there are some companies with different equipment that may give you that option. And a good example is Paratech. You have your gray and your gold struts and they're gonna give you tabulated data for a two to one, three to one and four to one safety factor. So therefore you can pick and choose the safety factor that you're comfortable operating in based on the situation. And you're gonna have data that goes along with that. But if the manufacturer just gives you a seven to one safety factor and a, and a working load limit and they don't specifically say that it's acceptable to use utilize they don't give you data for a four to one and a five to one as well then i would not exceed the working load limit of that and i would maintain that seven one safety factor just for liability liability and safety purposes okay chris colonel asked this question 
Is there any benefit or reason why the manufacturer has a safety factor instead of having the safety factor built into the system? Um, the safety factor is built into the system. So that's understanding the difference between our working load limit and our minimum braking strength. So those, the, the minimum braking strength divided by the working load limit is going to give you your safety factor. So that is going to be built into the system. And the reason that the manufacturer is going to mandate and put those in is they're mandated by ASME as like the manufacturers are required to have all those things to meet a specific safety factor and ratio built into them already. Okay, GRNE asked this question. So typical winch winches give the winch rate in as an MBS with no safety factor, correct? Um, so winches, um, the equipment that makes up the winch, like the cable and the hook, and if you're utilizing a snatch block, all of those equipment are gonna have their own working low limits and, and safety factors built into them. The winch itself is a motor that's basically driving a gear and axle. So how this works is, is your, your cable will have a, a minimum braking strength and a, a working load limit assigned to it. And it's going to be substantially higher than the rating of the winch. It's really, we can't really put a safety factor on a winch because it's a motor. Basically, what's going to happen is if you overload that winch, um, the winch just isn't going to pull the load. You're going to have too much weight on it, and the, and the mechanical advantage that's built into the gear system of the winch isn't going to be able to overcome it, and nothing's going to move that cable eventually obviously would break, but the strength of that cable is gonna far out seed the force that that electric motor or hydraulic motor on that winch can generate. So it's just basically, you're not gonna get anything out of it. So understanding how the winch works, like I said, it's a wheel and axle. So your, we talked about that max pull zone, your winches are marketed as the strongest best case scenario. That's that one layer of wrap, right? Somewhere between four or five, depending on what the manufacturer says, and one full layer. So your drum of the winch is your axle, and then you, your gears on the sides that drive it are essentially your wheel. So it's a ratio between the two. So if I had a one inch axle and a four inch gear, that gives me a four to one ratio. Well, as I put cable back on that drum, that axle is getting bigger. So that ratio is diminishing. So the amount of pull force that that winch can output based on the size of the axle is diminished. It's gonna get a little faster because you're pulling more cable because the drum's getting bigger, but your pull capacity is gonna diminish which is why we talk about that pull zone to maximize for say you have a 10 or 12,000 pound winch to get that 10 or 12,000 pounds. That's with that one layer of wrap. And once you start increasing the drum size, your deficiency decreases. Okay. Walter Everson asks, can you talk about connecting into a chain with a winch and efficiency loss depending on your connection? Um, that's going to basically come down to the thing we talked in the presentation earlier, the DD ratio. So depending on what size hook you're hooking into that chain, the bigger the hook, the more surface contact it's going to make with that, that link that you're hooking into could potentially be side loaded. So the bigger that hook, the better off you are. If you have a really small, narrow hook and you start pulling against that chain and it's side loading, you could, you're going to decrease the rating on that chain. Like essentially, like I said, if that hook meets the same, if it's a three eighths inch hook and I mean, you based on your surface contact, you could lose anywhere from 20 to 50% of that chain rating based on what you're doing by hooking it in like that. So um, I know a lot of guys will actually hook a shackle around the chain and then put the pin of the shackle through the hook of the winch to kind of beef up that DD ratio to kind of give you a stronger connection point and maximize it a little bit. Okay, Brian asked, can you talk about the best chain attachment practice for strut to strut with chain involved in DD? Um, best practice is, if, like we said, we showed in the PowerPoint, if you have uh, chain connections with those locking sling hooks and you can wrap those around the uh, your D handles, that's your best option. And then you can either put a chain shortener and a binder in the middle with cradled hooks and tension everything up that way to give you your full capacity. Your next option would be taking your your crate, your hook and hooking it directly to the D handle. Like I said, there is a there is a loss there and that really is determined by the hook that you're using. Some three eighths inch hooks are beefier than others. So it's gonna be somewhere between a two and a 10% loss based on the hook you're having. The bigger the hook, the better. Just understand that that rating is not on the chain, it's on the hook itself. And your hook, is the, the rating stamped on it is gonna be stamped the same as your chain because it's designed to go coincide with that chain. But that hook, the links of your chain would, would, would fail much sooner than that hook itself would. And also the D handle on your Paratech struts is 5,000 pounds at a four to one safety factor. So technically the weakest link in that setup would be the D handle. So the D handle, the bolt of the D handle would let go before your 
your hook open. So best case scenario, self-locking sling hooks. If you don't have those as an option, take your cradle, your, your grab hook and hook it straight into the D handle and then bind them up. But the last thing, the last option I would use is trying to basket the chain back on itself. That's the where you're going to get the biggest reduction in your chain reading. Okay, Cole asked a question. What's the strength difference in the Paratech multi-head versus the chain head? I can answer that, Josh. Yeah, go ahead. Cole, the strength difference is basically, if you look at the Paratech multi-head, it'll take a 3A chain. And if you look at the grade 120 3A chain, the strength of that with a 4 to 1, that's where that head will take plus more. If you look at the, the, the multi-chain head, that chain head is made for a half-inch chain. So again, your half inch chain with a grade 120, that head is made to exceed that four to one safety factor on that chain. So that's the difference. It's not, it's not the difference in the head, it's the difference in the chain that will take. Uh, the chain head will take the full meat of the link, whereas the multi head takes the full end of the link. I hope that explains the difference in the multi and the chain. Ryan asked a question, does the width or size base ring on the struts matter when the D2D is involved? Um, okay, can you read that? Which, hand, which connections are we talking about? Does the width or size base ring on the struts matter when the D2D is involved? Yeah. So Basically, I think he's talking about the, the D-ring. Yeah, so the, the D-ring, whatever struts you're using, um, if you're not using Paratech and you're using another manufacturer, um, whatever diameter that ring is that you're wrapping that chain through is going to basically play. Cause like I said, everything comes down to that DD ratio to get the full capacity of our chain. We need to have a six to one DD ratio. So that means that ring should be, um, six times the diameter of your chain. If you're going to basket it back on itself. So you would basically take the diameter of that, of that ring you're wrapping it through and do the mass, the math based on what size chain you're using and just know that chain. If it's like I said, with, the, with the Paratech that, that D handle is three eighths inch diameter, then the chain is three eighths inch diameter. You have a DD ratio of one to one. So your chain at a one to one is 50%. So bigger is better. Okay. okay. GRNE. Because we typically pull in horizontally in a life safety environment, should we apply overhead lifting standards to the most fire department operations? Um, so that's a decision you have to make as a like as a company and as a um, as a as a department. Um, if you don't ever intend using your chain as overhead lifting chain in like the USAR world or working with recovery, and you have no intention of ever lifting things vertically and working underneath them, then um, if you operate outside of those limitations, like I said, that doesn't apply to horizontal movement. You can use grade seventy chain and other carbon steels to do horizontal dragging and winching and stuff like that. But if you're going to potentially be doing vertical lifting and as a um, as a safety standard, even if you're not doing true, tr true overhead lifting, but you're going to start doing some other dynamic things that can uh, like compound forces like winching and um, compound scenarios like where you have really big friction coefficients, uphill grades, um, large loads and anything like that where you can con compound forcing forces on your equipment. I, I would recommend applying the the overhead lifting principles and rules and regulations to your to your equipment, but that's based on a department need and requirement, I would say. Okay, we got one more question here, and this is from GRNE again. Can we also do a test calculation for winching with damage grade gradient? For example, a four thousand pound car with two wheels damaged down a thirty five percent grade up to axle in mud okay um so that's kind of a complex question you you're getting first we need to know our vehicle weight where we said it's four thousand pounds so know that um if two wheels are not rolling then i'm dealing with basically a third of the load so um i can do that math but if i'm starting off stuck in the mud then i could be pulling 200% of that load. So to get that thing to break out of that mud and suction in up, up to the axles, like that 4,000 pounds, I could now be plying, be, a, be pulling 8,000 pounds. And now I have to add the uphill grade into that as well with 35 degrees could be somewhere to another 100 to 
somewhere between 75 and 100 percent. So you could easily have that car in a situation where you're pulling eight, nine, ten thousand pounds. And then once you get it broken out of the mud, um, you've kind of that load will now come off of it. And then you would be basically dealing with your two fixed axles and two rolling axles, which would be a third of the vehicle weight. So you could basically take that vehicle and put it in all sorts of different situations and decrease or increase the load that's being applied and understand it's dynamic. Once you get through that, then the load's going to come off. Like a perfect example is if I have an underride scenario and I lift the truck and I go to drag the car and I have all four suspension captured, I'm going to be pulling somewhere between two thirds and hundred percent of that vehicle weight. Um, I actually account for hundred percent. I just say 25% per, per axle. It gives me a little wiggle room and it's just easier to do the math. So if I know I have four wheels that are fixed, I'm pulling hundred percent of that vehicle weight. As I start to pull it out and I get daylight and I, the further I pull the car, then I can start release, maybe release the back suspension. And now I've just cut that force that I'm dragging in half. And then once I get the car completely out, release the front suspension. And typically if the, if the car is in, park or the parking brakes to you're only going to have at the most two wheels rolling so you're at least pulling 50 percent so i know that was kind of a long-winded answer but it's going to be completely dependent on the situation and the weight of the vehicle okay yeah. oh okay i'm sorry i was waiting to see it but um one thing we did not talk about is I did give you a sling uh, tension calculation in the PowerPoint for a balanced load. And there were people asking about unbalanced loads. It's pretty, uh, it's a pretty complex um, equation to figure out. So I didn't really want to turn this into a math class, but I did want to show it to you. If anybody wants to apply, uh, take those numbers and you can kind of work yourself through the problem and figure it out that there is a calculation for an unbalanced load. Just understand the big thing to get is you're going to have obviously a higher percentage of load on one side than the other. So you can basically find the center of gravity and do the math based on each side of that. You can have an idea. Uh, just understand that the, the heavier side, obviously that sling is going to have substantially more tension on it than the other. So I just wanted to put that in there so people have the ability to see it and play with it on their own if they chose to. Yep. Thank you, Josh. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the webinar. Uh, until the next time, uh, we'll see you later. And this presentation will be up in the YouTube, so you can go back and take a look at it anytime you want. Uh, again, my name is Nigel Leatherby. I'm the, the training manager with Paratech. Along with us was uh, Chris Fremstead. He's the RSM down in Texas. And again, thank you to Josh Thompson with uh, Blue Collar Network for uh, helping us with this presentation and doing the presentation for us. Thanks Thank for you. having me.